right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this replay of our session on critical thinking memory improvement tips. We're going to think through the lens of one critical thinker in particular who, if you don't know, is really, really fascinating and will help you improve your memory and critical thinking at the same time. This is Anthony Metivier, of course, here in the Magnetic Memory Method headquarters in Brisbane. Hit the thumbs up if you're just joining us and let me know in the chat where you are in the world and get prepared to ask any questions you like about memory and how to improve it and critical thinking. The genesis of why we're going to talk about how to think of like Plato so that we can remember more and how we can use the life of self-examination to improve our memory and then how to mentally model some of the Socratic dialogue styles and methods really comes from people asking me again and again and again, will memory techniques help improve my critical thinking abilities and how so? So we're going to talk about that today and you're going to walk away with the ability to use memory techniques, to think more critically and to think more critically because of using memory techniques. And so it's a very beautiful, perfect circle. So if that sounds good to you, hit that thumbs up. Let me know in the chat that you can actually hear me, that you're actually live and kicking because um, we really don't even need to roll if it's just zombies, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so um, while that's uh, coming in, I'm just going to say if you missed the last live stream, you're really missing out because we talked about the method of Loki and using mind mapping to figure out multiple options of how that you can use the method of Loki to find more memory palaces. And as you're finding more pal memory palaces, find more memory palaces and have wonderful links together of multiple ideas and get more magnetic imagery out of it. And so you're going to want to go back and check that out if you haven't, because it was a real doozy. So Reclaiming Life is here. Great to see you. Thanks for saying hello. And that is uh, wonderful, wonderful. Always great to have you here. And uh, uh, thank you too for uh, your contributions on the uh, previous live streams. Always appreciate that. Nicholas is here from Southeast Wisconsin. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I have been pulled over by the police in Wisconsin. What an adventure that was. Um, you are asking, how can I improve my memory starting from scratch? You need to learn fast. What are the best of the best if one is on a crazy time frame? And thank you for confirming that you can hear me loud and clear. Great question, Nicholas. The best of the best is ultimately the memory techniques you're actually going to learn and use. So if you are willing to sit down and get the free course, you'll see on the screen there's a link there that says magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. That link is down below. If you go and you take that free course and you start creating memory palaces, there's no reason under the sun why that you cannot have this as a, a, a very, very good skill that lasts you for life and stands the test of time and gets better and better the more that you SIP, which stands for study these techniques, implement these techniques, and practice these techniques. Now, we want to avoid looking for magic bullets, but this is the closest thing to real magic that exists and will ever exist. So just dive in and... One of the things that sounds kind of weird, but is really, really important is try not to overthink it, right? Because there's this opportunity to just like totally massively over overthink things, um, but you don't want to do that. So if you have any issues finding memory palaces and so forth, well, go watch, well, it's on this side, mind, ma mind mapping the method of Loki or loci or loci. Uh, it's one of those words that just has multiple possible translations. This will help you. Uh, and that's why I created it because, you know, the more ways that we can find people, uh, at points of entry into actually unlocking the vast powers of your spatial memory the better off that you will find the best memory uh, methods starting from scratch, as you put it, because the reality is, is that there is only one method, and that is using space. And it that's what the memory palace is. It's a location-based mnemonic. Every mnemonic image you ever create will be located in space, either somewhere in the chemical bath of your brain. It'll always be in the space of the chemical bath of your brain somewhere. Uh, likely more than one somewhere uh, in the neural networks, but also every magnetic image that you create or mnemonic image that you create will always be to the left of another one, to, above one, below one, to the diagonal of one, and so forth. So it's really a spatial 
technique that involves mental rotation. So if that's something for you, then learn the memory palace first as the foundation so you can build all the other skills from the ground up rather than what the mistake a lot of people do, which is to try and like just go around and try to find the best technique and so forth. And then they end up trying to build from the roof down. And then of course that roof collapses very quickly because they don't have any foundations underneath it. So that's uh, that, and you can get that at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. And it is built for beginners with the emphasis on starting with the most powerful foundation of the memory palace. Um, and speaking of training, I want to mention John Graham was on the podcast last week, 2018 uh, USA Memory Champ. Really, really great conversation. Many, many people have uh, said that they enjoyed it. Uh, the link is down below in the description box. If you haven't heard it, bookmark time to listen to it because we talk about memory training and a concept of using uh, acceptable and willful obstructions to make the training a little bit harder so that you can actually get greater results faster. And so it's kind of counterintuitive. It's one of those things, don't overthink it, just do it. And uh at least listen to the interview. So you have the full benefit of hearing from John Graham because his uh, performance is really, really uh, impressive. But not only is, is it really super impressive in what he's been doing, but he also is a great teacher of these techniques. And while you're there, hit the share buttons, the thumbs up buttons, and whatever you prefer, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, uh, LinkedIn, because it uh, is always odd to me to see some of the best material on the podcast so undershared when, you know, things like the Digital Amnesia episode have 468 shares. So, you know, like what's going on <laughs> when something so good as uh, what John Graham is doing is undershared and this is not overshared by any stretch of the imagination. But really, um, we, need to, we need to see th 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 this real deal memory training like really, really get uh, get its worth. So go on over there and uh, support the cause by hitting that that those share buttons and let's get it up to where it deserves to be, which is like 468 shares. Uh, likewise, with um, how to practice memory training techniques, it's a uh, little bit undershared there at 25 shares when it's just one of the most valuable episodes on the, uh, the podcast. So go and check that out and support us by... Hitting the thumbs up on this video right now, saying hello in the chat, and when you're over there, sharing these things around. And it's not just about sharing it with um, with other humans, but also letting the robots know that are slowly creeping into controlling all our lives that uh, <laughs> that you appreciate this, that humans like this, and humans care about this wonderful tradition of memory training and voices like uh, John Graham's and you know the real stuff that it takes to to get these techniques working for you. So Nicholas says, I s took a screenshot and we'll check it out after. Thank you, kind sir. Lots of cool emojis. Laser focused now. It's like talking to Einstein. Well, thank you <laughs> for that. That's a, that's a very, very big compliment indeed. And uh, you say that you will share too and you've already liked it. Excellent, thank you so much. You got pencil and pad in hand with no distractions, rock on. All right, I love all these emojis and great about note taking. There's actually also a whole podcast about different ways you can take notes um, on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast. And so thank you for your support. Um, also just wanna say a shout out to Christian Fitzharris who sent this uh, t-shirt, the Magnetic Mary Method t-shirt and wonderful guitar and music stack. If you haven't heard our episode together, um, you want to um, check that out as well. And same principle applies. Share it around because we had an amazing discussion about brain exercises and uh, uh, just so many things, especially the Oliver Cromwell effect. And the Oliver Cromwell effect is his term for something that I've been barking at for years and years and years. And if you don't know it, you need to know it. So go and make sure that you bookmark time to listen to this. The link is down below with Christian Fitzharris. And uh, also, if you want to support the show, get some swag and uh, you can get a t-shirt like he has here and you get a free video when you send me your pick with that. And Christian, of course, is in the masterclass and the mastermind. And we uh, are actually doing a brain game series right now. We started to chart it out. We're going to record some videos for you about brain games, memorizing poetry, memorizing raps, memorizing different things uh, that might 
you know, help you and then juggling and all kinds of stuff. So he's really, really uh, amazing dude. And that episode is gold. So listen to it if you haven't already. Peggy's here. Hello, Peggy. Great to see you. Uh, haven't seen you on a live stream for quite some time. Really been uh, missing you, actually. So good to see you. Thanks for saying hello. If you are just joining us, thumbs up and let me know in the chat where in the world you are, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And uh, Reclaiming Life says, I was just going to ask if the share button on the site helps with the bots because I always share from within my podcasting app. Oh, excellent question. Um, it does. I mean, basically, they're called uh, signals and uh, Google has <laughs> like dozens of them, but one of the best things you can do, to, and this, this is not just about me, like, or my project or our project, better said, with the Magnetic Memory Method uh, community, but it's about anything that you care about on the internet. There are numerous social signals. So sharing all those things, commenting on the uh, blog post, Maricella is always really great about that. And speaking of the coffee cups, there's Maricella with her Magnetic Memory Method uh, coffee cup. So I always appreciate her, uh, you know, she's, commented on the John Graham episode, for example, and they're watching that. And it's actually getting more and more important. So one of the odd things about the internet is that, you know, we're very blessed and fortunate to use this particular platform that we're meeting on right now to have a great time today. Uh, but they're like pressing you on the one hand to use this more to help their them grow their business so they can essentially show you a bunch of ads that are um, probably nothing to do with any stretch of improving your life by any, or but anything to do with improving your life by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, at the same time, Google itself is like increasing the importance of activity on a person's own website. So we like appreciate it one way or the other, all the comments and so forth here on the YouTube videos. But actually, the real deal is to do both and be active on the blog itself because that's a signal that is used for what's called SEO. If you don't know what that is, search engine optimization. So again, it's, it's bigger than any individual person, but the people you care about who are doing grassroots efforts, doing all they can on this changing ocean of the internet that is gradually being corporatized, that is going to be segmented sooner than later with things like the GDPR and uh, basically massive efforts at essentially taxing the snot out of everything. If you want to actually pr help preserve the internet then, and make it actually possible that people like myself and the other people you care about can actually do these things for you, then you've got to support it. And one of the best ways to do it is to be active on their sites. So that's uh, what this call is all about. And there's many ways to support this kind of work. And of course, you get a free video when you get some swag, either one of those t-shirts or the coffee cup. And uh, really there's a uh, an extraordinary uh, deal there for you because this is a video that is going to really take it to the next level. So Adolfo sent this picture uh, in the Ninja machine with his Magnetic Memory Method Cup. And of course, Very Kurtz has this one. It's not some kind of epic uh, uh, money-making enterprise or anything like that, but just a cool way for people to get a video and uh, be more engaged and active and then use these cups actually as memory devices. And there's a couple of other suggestions in there for you too. Um, so go ahead and do that at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash swag. If you like, send me the picture and the video will be yours. So uh, all that is to say that I mean, I mean, that's going to help you improve your memory, but you also want to get the free course. And so this, uh, this presentation today is sponsored by yours truly, Anthony Metivier from MagneticMerryMethod.com. And if you don't have the free memory improvement kit, go to MagneticMerryMethod.com forward slash YT, and we'll help you recall complicated, complicated formulas, speak any language faster by memorizing words and vocabulary. If you are in a field where you have to deal with a lot of technical terminology and so forth will help you memorize it. And I think most importantly, being able to just absorb ideas rapidly from books, lectures, video programs that you watch and take notes from, or just memorize in real time through having a solid, proper, substantial memory palace strategy. And not just any kind of memory palace strategy, but a magnetic memory palace strategy. So, um, Lucas is here. Hello, Lucas in KC. Thank you so much for letting us know you're thinking about the Chiefs wins over LA. I don't know, uh, the, the, the sports world that well, but, um, I know that if you wanted to memorize sports stats and stuff, well, the major method would help. Um, let's see. Reclaiming life. 
is it the cup of knowledge? It might, it might be, it might be. Um, it is certainly a cup into which not only knowledge can be stored, but replicated. And then ma once you know the, the technique that I'm talking about, you'll be able to reproduce it in multiple, multiple ways that will be quite useful to you throughout life. Um, Nicholas says, you should put together a list of channels to be active on. Otherwise, it's overwhelming with so many choices that most choose none or dumb stuff. Just a thought. That's a good idea. I've actually been humming and hawing over, you know, a top 10 list. And it would be one for podcasts, one for uh, YouTube and so forth. And that's coming. So that's a great suggestion and good to know that you would like that, Nicholas. If you have suggestions, keep them coming. Always appreciate that. Peggy says, I made a mind map while watching and listening to your last replay that you did about memory palaces and low-key stations. It was so pretty, I took a pic and emailed it to you today not long ago. Oh, Peggy, thank you for that. I haven't really been on email because I've been focused on uh, getting this presentation ready for you all. Um, but I will check that out. And if I have your green light to share it, then we'll show it on a future video if that's cool with you, uh, which would be awesome to uh, show a mind map about our mind map video, <laughs> that would be great. And uh, if you didn't check out that previous live stream, I think you'll find it well worth it because it's not just, you know, here's how to mind map, but a demonstration of mind mapping in action and uh, give you some ideas. And basically I'm learning more and more about how to apply the ideas in mind map mastery by Tony Buzan, which I highly recommend that you check out. All right, so. Keep those uh, comments coming as we go through this and uh, hit that thumbs up. Let me know in the comments. If you're watching the replay, leave a comment below on the replay what you uh, think about all these ideas, these issues with 21st century education online with the internet and uh, you know any questions that you have about this. So we're going to do critical thinking and memory improvement as a skill that one enhances the other. The more that you know about and practice critical thinking, the more your memory will work better. And the more that you use memory techniques, the more you can become a critical thinker. And in today's video, we want to focus on a particular dude named Plato. And the reason why is, well, look, there's lots of reasons why, but you've got to like start in critical thinking somewhere. And when I was thinking about this, I thought, where did I really like hit the ground running with this? And it was with Plato, reading the Republic. And this was in a second year political uh, science course back when I thought I was going to get my BA in political science. And it totally changed my life, this book, The Republic. And uh, so I'll share with you why. And it's, it's a super memorable book um, that, you know, really teaches you critical thinking in the form of what is essentially a play. So it's also very easy to enter into philosophy and critical thinking because you're able to imagine these different characters talking to each other as opposed to heavy duty lumps of paragraphs, or as my good friend Kane X Fauché calls them, paragrowls. <laughs> like it's just not this heavy duty reading, but rather little snippets of dialogue where people are essentially contesting with each other over ideas. And so this already is good for your memory because you're able to juggle multiple viewpoints in your head and follow them. It's kind of like watching tennis in some sense. And uh, these, th they're characters. They, they're characters who have personalities. So it's a really, really fascinating thing. And you almost can't put the damn thing down once you get started. And I actually read The Republic. Well, I was at the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George, British Columbia, and I used to walk. I couldn't afford to take the bus at the time, so I or I had to like limit the amount of times I took the bus because uh, of trying to save to pay the rent and eat. I had three jobs at the time uh, so that I could pay for school for university. And uh, wow, what an amazing memory that is! And if you know University of Northern British Columbia, it's at the top of this giant hill great series of memory palaces in that in that building very interesting structure but it's at the top of a giant hill and if you chose the wrong time of day you would find yourself running from moose that would just appear there <laughs> it's really really crazy um but i would walk up there and walk back down reading the republic uh from plato and it was really really an amazing way to read it 
precisely because actually these guys are walking a lot while they're talking with each other, or that's the way that, that I imagine it. Anyway, it's a really, really important uh, book in my own personal history for unlocking my critical thinking abilities, and I sort of took up the strategy that I'll share with you in this, in this live stream mentally to rotate ideas, use mental rotation to rotate ideas in the mind that improved memory, improved memory in some very, very foundational ways. So uh, Reclaiming Life says, did you ever reread it this year like you mentioned that you should in one of your podcasts from earlier this year? Great question. Thank you for remembering that. That's why we're doing this because I actually did reread it. And uh, the, then I just thought I really, you know, did a survey around some stuff. People were like, yeah, we want to learn about critical thinking. And like they chose out of all the possible options of things we could do. It was it was like this massive percent of 70, like 72 percent of people were just like, we want to learn critical thinking and memory. So it all just came together. And rereading The Republic was actually a very interesting thing because I don't sort of agree with it in the, in the same sense that I did back then. I was sort of hook, line, and sinker and, and kind of uncritical in some senses. Uh, but rereading it allowed me to practice critical thinking. And we'll, we'll get into that because uh, the pros and cons really, uh, they change over time. And so what Reclaiming Life is referring to is a podcast about the reasons why you should reread at least one book every month. And uh, I did indeed make it a, a reread. And it's not only fascinating because you encounter what you think you remembered in a different way. And some of those things you really did remember absolutely correctly. And in other ways, you didn't remember them well at all. And in other ways, you have all new mental material to snap into place as if it was mental Lego on, you know, new ideas and old ideas. And you just get this matrix of different stuff going on that you never experience if you don't reread the books that you've read. So um, that's really, really important and great question. Thanks for raising that. Physico is here. 21st century education online is bliss. <laughs> definitely, definitely, I agree. Without it, we could never search for helpful things for our day-to-day -day lives. Fun subjects are okay, but we really need some quality in our lives. Yeah, thanks for making that point, because search is changing. So beware that you need to enjoy it right now, because we don't know what it's changing into, but there's some spooky, goofy things going on, and uh, search is changing. That's all that I will say at the moment, but uh, it's really, really important to enjoy what we have right now, because the push to mobile, for example, is changing the nature of search. And also the habits around search are changing. And uh, the, the BS around the uh, attention span and all this stuff about people being encouraged to believe that their attention span is like a goldfish is bogus science. It's not true. We have a podcast episode all about that, which was also very heavily shared on the site. I'm really proud of that one. And I think one of the reasons it was so heavily shared is because of the science of the goldfish attention span is really, really interesting. And it's really, really interesting that a, a, a negative, bankrupt, bizarre meme is going around that people have the attention span of less than goldfish. It's not true. Not only is it not true, but it's just blatant, self-punishing, uh, corrupt... Uh, nonsense about human intellect and human craving for knowledge that just doesn't make any sense. So in any case, we need to enjoy what we have right now because there are some movements that are leading to snippetization of content that are, are just absolutely bankrupt based on really, really strange interpretations of scientific literature that people can't even read properly anymore. Uh, and it doesn't have to do with attention span. Has to do with it has to do with digital amnesia, right? And so your attention span is fine. It's just the digital amnesia that's the real problem. And so we can uh, talk about that uh, <laughs> in greater depth. But Plato is a great corrective of this, actually. So the good timing for this. Um, Reclaiming Life says the Snowflake Society generation gets a lot of things wrong. Yeah, well, it's not just it's it, it it's not just that, but it's the it's the corporate interests that actually are monetizing it. Right. So the reason why it's becoming accelerated is because they figured out how to make money out of it. And that's the sickening. That's the sickening thing. So, um, oh, look, weakening, weakening humanity actually makes us more profit. Let's now 
politicize it and monetize the politicization so that we can uh, keep it going. Uh, and so, yeah, if you want to be a critical thinker, Plato will help in this regard as well, as it improves your memory and helps you preserve your memory because you're enjoying what we have right now as an asset, fully understanding that everything that's cool about the internet could be gone before you know it. And it is, there are active movements to make it gone. And, uh, if you follow, you know, the, the, like the, the, the Weinsteins and the so-called um, dark web and whatnot, they appear, I don't know exactly what they're talking about, but they're sending out a lot of little messages here and there and what they're talking about, about essentially a replacement for the internet. And we're going to need it because it's being fragmented by corporate interests that want to destroy your ability to think for yourself to think critically. So that's another reason why I want to do this series. And uh, I don't want to stop with Plato. I'm happy to go through every philosopher that I know and help us model their critical thinking skills, provided that we do it with a focus on memory as well, uh, because there are certainly critical thinking skills that can reduce your memory, destroy your memory, and that's no good. So we want, we want to, uh, you know, get not just the creme de la creme, but we want to actually get the creme de la creme that's associated with memory. And Plato is associated with memory, and I'll share with you why, because he's actually the philosopher who enabled Aristotle to write his very important work on memory, which is a kind of a, a response to the Platonic ideas of memory. So that's very, very uh, powerful and important. Peggy says, yes, it's cool to use the mind map however I want. Thank you. I can't wait to see it in the email. I really appreciate that. Bruntiver is here. Hello, Bruntiver for strategy. Great to see you. Hello. Uh, Thomas from Virginia. Thomas, great to see you. Thanks for saying hello. And Christian is here. Wow, good to see you, Christian. Christian says, rereading books is crazy informative. I read the reread The Metamorphosis by Kafka recently, and it was completely different than 20 years ago from, from me. Recovery from Thanksgiving Feast Now. Cheers. Oh, you're recovering now. Oh, I thought it was happening now. Uh, <laughs> well, good to see you. And yeah, Kafka. And you know, uh, one of the things about, um, what is it in German? Die Verwandlung, uh, The Metamorphosis, is uh, uh, it changes too if you go to the Kafka Museum uh, and yeah, my, my, my feelings to Kafka have changed a lot over the years because uh, I used to think one way and now I think something else. And, and, and reading uh, that in German, Auf Deutsch, is also a way of changing your, your, your brain because it's not really a bug or an insect. It's more like a vermin, and uh, that changes a lot. And there's different details like the portrait in the wall and so forth. But anyway, really cool book one way or the other. And one cool since we're on the critical thinking angle here, one cool book you might want to check out that would, that would, it, I, I don't recall that it actually mentions Kafka specifically, but it's called Powers of Horror, an essay on objection by Julia Kristeva. Really cool way of thinking about, you know, cats like Kafka. All right. Um... Reclaiming Life says, if you want a great overview of most of the Western philosophers, Sophie's World by Joe Stein Garter is brilliant and a great book. Great. Thanks for that suggestion. I'm going to look that up. And uh, let's uh, just type that in right now. So we don't forget, you know, when you don't have to remember stuff, all the better. Joe Stein Garter. Okay, there it is on my screen. Beautiful. Thank you for that suggestion. Looks like it has a really cool book cover. All right, and Peggy says, I wonder if I could find Republic written in Spanish with your language learning tips. I'm advancing more in Spanish than in German. That way I could reread Plato and increase my Spanish. Yeah, well, I'm sure you can find uh, the Republic. Um, uh, I've looked at it in German. I haven't read the whole thing in German. I think it's called Der Stadt in uh, German. Um, but uh, I'm sure you can find it in, in Spanish. And uh, I think in... Uh, in if you're progressing more in Spanish than in German, probably it's the the uh, abundance of cognates, right? Because I, there's like eleven uh, eleven cognate rules that if you know them, you've just unlocked something in the area of twenty two hundred uh, Spanish words, just like that. Just learn the eleven cognate rules, and away you go. <laughs> you, you know Spanish <laughs> uh, quite well. Uh, no, you don't know it that easy. Nothing's the magic bolt that way, but it is pretty close to magic, just memorizing those uh, 11 cognate rules. Uh, 22's Nuss is here from SoCal. Trying to learn Spanish. Any tips? Yes. Create a magnetic memory method 
uh, memory palace network and then organize your vocabulary in an effective way memorize the vocabulary add phrases to the vocabulary after you've memorized the vocabulary read write speak and listen to spanish we've got a enhanced ebook on the topic that you can get if you like Bruntiver says anthony it's very appreciated to receive your tips but note that it's because some of us are lucky enough to have found our inner strength and are taking the time to try and do them actively. I can speak for myself on that matter. Even after having done the master class, you keep making quite a difference in my learning on memory. Wow, thank you for that, Bruntiver. And yeah, there's um, there's a number of things going on in what you just said, because if you, you know, have an existing level of competence, then you're going to uh, have a wonderful experience that uh, already is hitting the ground running. But if you, um, if you for any reason need to, uh, you know, need to build that competence, then you're going to have a different experience. And so all of this is meant to complement all of those experiences and make them the best possible set of experiences they can be for multiple levels of students at the same time. Uh, and so, you know, the actual value of going into the master class is amplified by what you may have done before and then compounded and amplified again and again by what you do after. So thanks for sharing that point. Um, and that's by design and has to do with the whole ethics of the magnetic memory method training and how it works through um, progressively SIP, studying these techniques, implementing these techniques over time, and practicing them with information that improves your life. So speaking of information that improves your life, let's get started and uh, keep your questions coming. If you're joining us now, just hit the thumbs up. Let me know in the chat where you are in the world. And uh, if you have questions as we go along about anything, pop them in to the chat and uh, hope to see uh, your thoughts here. Um, and away we go. So who was Plato and who cares? Well, he was a dude and he was born. They don't know exactly when and they don't necessarily know exactly where, but they figure Athens. And uh, so it's either 428 or 427 BC that he's born and dies 348, 347. So one of the things you can do to memorize dates like that is use a PAO uh, or the major method. And so you might want to look at uh, 42. For me, 42 is a samurai from the Kurosawa movie Ren, right? Because R, 4 is R, 2 is N, and when you make a word out of that, you get ran, and not just any ran, like not the abstract idea of someone running, but ran, as in a samurai from the movie Sa uh, Ran by Kurosawa that I've seen with my own eyes, so that it's very concrete, right? Then he can just be the samurai can be chopping through a snowman because eight kind of looks like a snowman, right? Woo! <laughs> so uh, go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash snowman for a special uh, free course if you don't have it already. And uh, don't forget the evil Dr. Forget is also a snowman who can melt your memory like snow if you don't use the ma magnetic memory method, right? Woo! He's the evil Dr. Snow um, who is constantly, constantly at the heels of Edgar the Elephant. So, you know, be Edgar the Elephant and not let the evil Dr. Snow, get, <laughs> evil Dr. Forget, get in get in there and start melting your memory. Um, because uh, <laughs> this is a, a war that never ends. Never ends, unless that you constantly focus on taking it one sip at a time, like Edgar does. All right, so Plato's born 428, and uh, you can memorize that date. Then you can memorize the date that he died. Um, so uh, when we look at 34, for me, this is the mayor from the Piers Anthony novel, uh, Nightmare, uh, from the Xanth series. Now, I never saw that actual horse, but uh, it was on the cover of one of these things. I often think, too, about Johnny Cash's uh, song, The Tennessee Stud which uh, mentions a mare in it at one point. But anyway, it's a horse, and uh, it's uh, pretty good. And now it, we can just have the horse maybe doing something rude to the snowman or biting the snowman's face off or whatever it is, right? So now we just got to think, and we do this in a memory palace, of course, and maybe the corner of a room or something like this. So now we got a samurai chopping off the head of a snowman. 
especially if that snowman is the evil Dr. Forget. Oh no, my head has been chopped off. And then somewhere else, we just can have the uh, horse uh, chomping off his face or whatever. So now we got the dates memorized. Isn't that great? Now, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to memorize dates? Well, because later you might encounter a date that uh, can snap on into place to help your critical thinking skills, right? So you might, we might encounter a date uh, coming up here. But in any case, that's how that works. And you develop critical thinking skills by, in one sense, comparing and contrasting and running timelines through your head, right? So one of the cool things is, is if you love the memory tradition and then you know that uh, um, Hamlet was written in 1600 or thought to be have been written then by Shakespeare and then you know that Bruno was put to the stake in 1600, well now you have a memory tool that not only helps you see history as a timeline, but it also helps you one date remember the other, right? And so having these dates in mind, they can really help you. And in order to get it into long-term memory, well then, you know, you just gotta use recall rehearsal. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. So he, uh, during this period of history, he came up with something that came to be called the School of Platonism. And uh, we'll talk about what that is and why it's super, super important. And, uh, you know, this painting, uh, the School of Athens, helps us see what Plato maybe looked like uh, uh, and what it might have been like to be, you know, chatting philosophy with Plato. Um, now, here's another date, right? So Raphael painted this. They think it's between 1509 to 1511. They also think that maybe the face of Plato here is, uh, is based on Leonardo. Uh, the important point really is that he's pointing to heaven, and that's to remind us of a particular thing. Because if we look at the dude that he's behind, Aristotle, uh, in the blue, he's pointing outwards, and that is meant to signify pointing to the world. So Plato was pointing to the heaven, the perfect forms in heaven, and all these ideas that we'll talk about in a minute. But um, Aristotle's pointing to the world, and essentially, uh, you know, we can talk about Aristotle at a different time. But um, the reality is, is that this is a, a beautiful, beautiful uh, painting that you may have seen. It's in, it was in the Sistine Chapel when I was there, and uh, I was quite surprised. That I didn't realize it was there. I just turned the corner, and then boom, School of Athens. Um, but uh, it's interesting to be able to visualize it, and then to think, what would Raphael have been thinking to base Plato, if he did, on Leonardo's face? So that's kind of cool uh, to think about. But that matter aside, what was Platonism, and who the heck cares, right? So it's a theory of forms, and basically what that means, and we're not going to go into some sort of master class about the theory of forms, but it essentially means that things like concepts like heaven, and, or sorry, uh, justice, and you know other things that are kind of abstractions are actually, they're actually real, and they exist eternally in, say, a place like heaven. Now, heaven isn't quite the right word, but it's the good. And the good is where things are eternal, and they're true. Anything that is, uh, is on earth is a pale representation, a pale copy, a shadow of that perfect thing in heaven. And it's not just abstractions like justice that are eternally true in some sort of good place up in the sky where he's pointing up to there, but even things like chairs and tables are... Uh, shadowy representations of the perfect table up in the good. And so this is really, really important. Now, I think that Plato's probably wrong about all that stuff, but the important thing is, that for our purposes, is that he's reasoning about this through skepticism. This is the critical thinking tool that improves your memory. And he does it through dialogue, right? Which also is a critical thinking tool that will improve your memory for reasons we'll talk about. But the important thing to understand is that it's not just, well, I've got this idea that everything is up in heaven and yada, yada, yada. It's that he's going to demonstrate it through a particular means, which is being skeptical of his own assumptions 
being skeptical of all the assumptions of other people, pro or con, and there are some cons we'll get to, and then reasoning through it with dialogue, which is essentially ideas interpreted in action through dialogue. Through dialogue, right? Through the ebb and flow of conversation, which is something that ex exercises your memory. And in the world that we're in right now where people are talking to each other more through social media than they are face to face, we are having issues with exactly this problem. We are not experiencing the ebb and flow of conversation that exercises our memory. So how do we do with it? How do we change? Well, we have more conversations that help us ex interpret ideas in real time in dialogue with one another. So that's very, very important because you need to mentally juggle competing ideas in order to grow and you'll remember them better when you do so, when you do so, not being passive about it, right? So uh, some people criticize Plato for having doctrine and dogmatism in his uh, thoughts and that is a con and I will talk a little bit more about that, but it's true. There is dog, dogma in it to a certain degree, and certainly there's some doctrine, but it is pushing you to not accept it and not be passively receiving it, but to have a dialogue about it and to see dialogue demonstrated in real time and get you into the discussion. So you are having heroic, active thinking, and you're not doing rote learning. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a very, very beautiful thing. Um, so you want to you want to think about how you can get actively engaged in thought in action through dialogue and skeptical dialogue, where you're challenging your own assumptions, the assumptions of others, and doing it in a way that encourages the mental rotation of competing ideas in order for you to develop critical thinking and remember what was said better because of the stretching and the mental exercise that takes place when you do this. So um, this is really, really important. Let me see, we got some questions here and uh, we'll just have a little pause and go through them. 22 Znus says, how long should my study sessions be and how long should my study breaks be in between studying sessions? Well, that's a great question, but before we answer it, let's try not to find magic numbers because you need to find that answer through your own practice uh, and it just depends on a number of factors. But generally, what are you studying and where are you studying it? And what do you think should be the, the answer? Think about what you think should be the answer and then run some tests. So I know some people really, really advocate that they need to have their uh, study sessions very, very brief, 15 minutes max. And that's fine if that works for them. Other people, they need to have their study sessions for 40 minutes or so. I know when I read books, like if I just put on a timer and say, I'm going to read this for 15 minutes, maybe if it's a particularly difficult text and I need it as a disciplinary measure to dive in and, you know, just say, like, bite the bullet. I got to read this. Here's the clock. I'm going to spend 15 minutes on it. That can work right? Because I don't want to read it or whatever. Um, but that's for a particular kind of information. So we can't look for magic numbers. We actually have to dive in, test different things for ourselves, and think about the nature of the information relative to the goal. And are we using memory techniques? Do we need to budget time for memory techniques? Uh, so there's a course uh, in the master class called the Master Plan, which has a whole video about the these kinds of uh, issues. And at the end of the day, it's more about building your strategy based on self-understanding, heroic act of thinking about you as a student, and then avoiding rote learning by testing your own consumption preferences. So I would try both. I, I would look at the information and say, how long can I actually read this and focus on it? And don't try to apply that to all information because uh, willpower, as Benjamin Hardy says here, doesn't work, right? I'm not t entirely convinced that that's the case. I'm writing a new book about this at the moment or that touches on these subjects. I think that will does exist and work, but you're actually not so much fighting against willpower, working or not working, but you're rather 
trying to uh, find where your boat is on the ocean of life and then figure out how to manipulate your sails better so you catch better wind to get to destinations that you actually want to get to. And so that requires self-sufficiency and it requires experimentation with your own boat in the conditions of your own life where you are now with a minimum of interference from advice that actually needs to be generated by you because those people can't see inside your life. They can't see inside of your head. And if you need coaching, then you go and get coaching so that you get an expert to essentially look at where you're at, help you see where you're at so you can craft a better journey, understand that boat, adjust your sails better, make sure that the wind that you're catching is taking you where you want to go, um, which is something that you want to do. But generally, when it just comes to how long my should my study sessions be and how long should I take breaks, no one can answer that. Anybody who gives you a pat answer to that is a fraud. You need to figure out yourself by looking at the information, thinking about your, your consumption preferences, thinking about the end game, the goal for that information, and then crafting the actual way that you're going to tackle it by actually tackling it, observing what it is that you are experiencing in the different ways of tackling that information, and then continuing to essentially rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, water, read and repeat, water, read and repeat and change because information that you study is going to change and you'll be like, well, this technique worked for uh, this book, but now it's not working for this book. You need to know how to adjust. You are the captain of your ship and you've got to learn how to captain it and only you can figure it out. Now, yes, there are some universal principles, but universal principles always come at a cost, which is that you need to understand them through practice and that's going to uh, help you a great deal. It's going to help you more than any book in the world. So that's uh, my take on that. Johnny's here. Thanks for saying hello. Johnny, if you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world. And uh, 22's asks, how many hours did Plato study a day? Uh, well, <laughs> good question. Time machine time. Um, uh, in uh Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, they brought back Socrates, not Plato, so uh, <laughs> we'll never know. Um, but in any case, I hope that answer helped you out. Um, let's see. Physical Gamer says, D Dr. Mithivier, if you were a secretary of education, what subject skills would you put in the curriculum to make children really useful for society and happier at the same time? Very, very interesting question. If I was the secretary of education, what subjects and skills would I put in the curriculum? Well, <laughs> uh, wow, definitely memory training for sure. I would add mnemonics as a core skill. So I don't know what the current curriculum looks like in your country, uh, Brazil, I believe you're in. Um, I don't know what it looks like in Canada where I went to school now. Uh, I don't know what it looks like in the United States. Uh, I don't know what it looks like in Germany or any other place that I lived, uh, China or whatever. I just don't know. But whatever it is, it should include mnemonics and critical thinking, for sure. As young as possible, I, I think around age 10 would be the best age to start introducing it, but could be earlier, could be earlier. Um, so I think... The actual skills are less important than what you're going to do to actually improve how you remember and how that you integrate the right knowledge into your life and be able to make better decisions about what you're going to do. Because what ends up happening is a lot of people, they get to university level, they're still not able to like see far enough into the future to make the decision about the topic that's actually going to help them in life. And so if they had more preparatory training in critical thinking and could remember more about what they learned in the past, they probably wouldn't make such tragic decisions about the degrees that they're going to get in debt from, uh, for, uh, when they, when they, uh, get into school, like they're just making tragically bad decisions because they have to see into a future 
that it's going to be very, very different by the time they end their degree, and they've forgotten so much of what they learned. They don't have the core basic competences. I mean, I taught at university for uh, 10 years, basically, uh, at the end of the day. I taught critical thinking itself for four years, and these people just come in, unfortunately and sadly, completely unequipped, and they if, if they've learned anything about structuring a sentence, they've completely forgotten it, and uh, they don't seem to have many life experiences to draw upon. So, yeah, I would add memory training so that they could remember more of what they learned and critical thinking training so that they could make better decisions and see more long term, uh, which is really, really important. All right. So reclaiming life is uh, sharing with 22 zones that it's better to figure out what works best for you. Possibly Pomodoro technique will maybe something different. will. yeah, when I mentioned setting on the timer, that's uh, that's called the Pomodoro technique. Um, I call it putting on a timer. But uh, in any case, whatever whatever ter term that you, it floats your boat, just be on the boat. All right. So, Physico says the myth of the cave is the theory of forms for dummies. Actually, it's also the theory of forms for smart people. Uh, very, very smart people as well. Uh, Peggy is sharing some mnemonics here. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for that. Beautiful. Um... Uh, Marichella says, hi there, I don't know who you are, but you belong here. Yes, indeed. Thumbs up to that. And uh, Johnny is saying, any books on critical thinking that I would recommend? Well, I would definitely recommend Plato's Republic, for sure. Uh, and that is because it demonstrates critical thinking out loud, uh, even if there's some issues about it. And uh, I'm probably going to write one as well from the memory perspective in the near future. Uh, but... Generally, I don't know that there's really any classic book that I would recommend, but also learn about fallacies and learn about uh, analytical philosophy and some of the syllogisms that are out there in order to help you see thought in action when it's happening. And also, you know, learn about the cognitive biases. And that's, there's just oodles of books that are, that are great about that. Uh, one that I think uh, you should check out is called um, you are not so smart. And that is a, a title that's always funny to say to people, you are not so smart. But uh, it is a great, great book that I would recommend uh, for sure. All right. So continuing here. Oh, hello, Cigar. Thanks for saying hello. Good to meet you here. Um, one of the things that's so important here about dialogue that we can learn from Plato is that you want to have a dialogue without a set conclusion. So you don't decide, you know, what the, what the final answer is. You're open continually to what new details will do to move that ship towards particular islands. Conclusions are islands. You don't necessarily stay there forever. And so this is one of the core opening appearances in the Western uh, tradition of thinking and philosophy of essentially empiricism, the scientific method, where you have claims and then you support those claims with evidence, right? And when the evidence doesn't support the claims, you either find better evidence or you find better claims. You make better claims. And this is a, a beautiful circular process um, that is ongoing and never ends. Science doesn't prove things. Science creates data that supports claims or helps us get rid of bad claims. And uh, this book, Skeptic by Michael Shermer, I would highly recommend as I didn't intend to uh, mention it today, um, but it talks about how um, that we need to bring together observation and than more theorizing about the observation. Uh, so we need data. We need data. And we can gather data through dialogue. But we need to let go of the outcome and let go of any single person being right about anything. Or better said, we must always allow our conclusions to be contingent upon further evidence. So this is part of what falsifiability is. And one critical thinking tool is to know what falsifiability is and to um, to 
allow, you know, things to be falsifiable. Be sure that you are open to falsifiability and allow for falsifiability. And basically what uh, Shermer is getting onto here is that the facts never speak for themselves. They are always viewed through the lenses of theory and uh, observation, views, data, and theory are the conjoined twins of science. And that's very, very important. And this is what we learned as a, as a, as a species, and Plato was a huge part of it in terms of the Western world, is we learned how to do that through dialogue. And the important thing about dialogue that I really want everybody to understand is that you, whoever you think you are, which is largely an illusion, uh, but there is a, a unit that you call you, that you've been trained to call you through a number of processes, in dialogue, in correct, proper dialogue, you are assembling with the process in the same way that your body assembles with a bicycle in order to make it reach a destination. And so you're part of creating these contingent conclusions that will be subject to change based on better evidence when better evidence is found. And how is better evidence found? It's found through continual discussion, continual dialogue. And so you expand your mind and your memory as you engage in dialogue, thinking out loud, and uh, and thinking out loud. I've got that twice there on my slides. Apologies for that. But uh, <laughs> as you think out loud and you actually dis you hear yourself thinking out loud and you hear others thinking out loud is what I meant to have there. Um, you need to... You need to do both. You need to see thinking out loud demonstrated and you need to do it yourself and be part of it so you can assemble with the dialogue in the world, right? And that's very, very important. We learn to do that in large degree from Plato. And, you know, Plato, of course, learned how to do it too because it was, it was a trend walking around talking about philosophy. And uh, it really, really helps, uh, helps you to learn and remember more faster by being in a dialogue. So... How do you do this? Well, if you're in university, you join study groups. If you're not in university, or even if you are in university, you go to discussion groups. So there's a, uh, a group here in Brisbane that's currently reading 12 Rules for Life. And uh, not too long ago, we had rule number five. And, uh, you know, you bring your book, you read in advance. You don't need a university. It's just a meetup group. You just go there. By the way, if you're in Brisbane, we're going to have the Magnetic Memory meetup group this coming week so uh make sure that you follow the link down below and join us um it's gonna be great but this is part of dialogue engaging in dialogue being assembled with the process and being open to the contingency of answers that are always cheerfully open to further analysis and debate and dialogue and discussion because that's what real scientists do and that's what real science is. And to not do that is bankrupt and criminal and not, uh, not, uh, not useful whatsoever. So, um, Reclaiming Life says, As odd as it sounds to say this, with how you ask about a book on critical thinking, the first one that came to mind on critical thinking is Alice in Wonderland. Excellent suggestion, Reclaiming Life. I totally agree. Alice is definitely practicing critical thinking throughout the book and what's so great about that suggestion is that she has a number of foils that challenge her critical thinking right and in some sense many of them are critical thinking uh, they are themselves doing acts of critical thinking and essentially they are part of like if you really think about what Lewis Carroll was trying to do, he's trying to show the assemblage, right? So it's not a simple hero's journey, but it's an assemblage. And Physical mentioned the allegory of the cave, and too many people think about it as an individual, but really that individual is super assembled with the actual cave and the other people. Now, I hadn't thought about it, but if I get enough hell yes, I will read the passage about Plato's cave that I am writing in my new book that has been drafted. But if you're really, really interesting and ever, uh, interested and everybody says, hell yeah, I'll show you what I mean by assemblage and read a passage from the new book, uh, which is all about critical thinking and it's about um, improving your memory through critical thinking and meditation, critical thinking in meditation and so forth. And I talk about this assemblage 
and why that it's a mistake to think of that character in the allegory of the cave as a singular unit. And uh, it's the same thing with uh, Alice in Wonderland. She is, she's, she is subject to the hero's journey, but she's not a singular subject. She's got a number of foils, and she assembles with them in order to achieve conclusions that cannot be achieved by an individual alone. And part of the whole logic and, and mystery of it all is, comes from the ability to, to be in assemblage. And anyway, there's a lot of puzzles and mathematical thinking behind what Carol is doing there. And so that's a great, great thing to raise. So we got, uh, let's see, two hell yells. That's it? Nick, <laughs> we'll see if we get some more. Um, Nicholas says, yeah, it's all about the money, money, money and control for the big corporation. Um from earlier conversation, freedom. I agree with your open-mindedness and setting your pride aside. Must stay hungry. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, what are you sipping on and what are you struggling with in life right now regarding this topic? What was that, Julia? Okay, so I was mentioning Julia Kristeva. The book is called uh, Powers of Horror, an essay on abjection. Not objection, but abjection. A-B-G-E-C-T-I-O-N. Kristeva, K-R-I-S-T-E-V-A. Um Really, really important book for many, many reasons. Uh, so check that out. Powers of Horror, an essay on abjection by Julia Kristeva. What am I sipping on right now? Well, it's water. Magnetic water. Uh, by the way, if you want to support that show, this show, get yourself a Magnetic Mary Method cup. You'll see from time to time the link there, magneticmarymethod.com forward slash swag. You can get a shirt. You can get a cup whatever it is you want to get. And uh, when you send me your pick with that on, then you will receive a free video. All right. So we got a hell yeah from Physico. We got hell yeah from Nicholas. We got Reclaiming Life with a hell yeah. Christian has hell yeah. Johnny has hell yeah. Peggy says H yeah. Richard's here from Florida. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Great. So um, let's do that in a minute. Uh, we'll, we'll read through that section. It's rough because it's in the rough draft, but I think you're going to get a kick out of it. Uh, and it's really, really important. But uh, before we move on, let's talk about some of the cons of Platonism because um, one of the things, the issues, and this is a legit criticism, and it's what I noticed in my reread, is that there's so many loaded questions that Plato, or Socrates better said, but Plato's the author here, right? So he, he, had, he had final cut, let's put it that way, or you know, one imagines that he did, I don't know. But um, leading questions, loaded questions, like the dude really is a persuasive uh, <laughs> persuasive guy. So is it a problem? Well, yes and no. But really what you want to do in your own practice is maybe be a bit less aggressive unless that there's some good, solid reason to, to do that. Uh, and just be aware of it as a human temptation. I think Plato probably had enough understanding of Greek tragedy and Greek comedy to uh, have done that to reveal to us the foibles uh, of being a human thinker who is constantly progressing towards the good. But if you're, if you, if you could read it negatively and then miss the point of, uh, of the Republic, for example. Uh, so I'm just pointing that out as something to watch out for and not be like, man, this guy's a jerk, right? Because I think there's probably theatrical reasons why that's there that are metaphorically representing human foibles and not meant to be interpreted as totally literal, but for dramatic purposes. And the point of uh, critical thinking skills and developing it is you'll see even in other kinds of philosophy that, uh, that people, like the dramatic effect is lost. And if you read Nietzsche, for example, so many people can't wrap their heads around Nietzsche because, uh, they don't see the theater and they also don't see the references to Plato because there are a lot of them. There's a lot of references to Greek philosophy in general that just fly over people's heads because they're not trained in philosophy, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to start this series insofar as it's going to become a series on critical thinking through the lens of different philosophers uh, relative to memory is simply because there's a lot of theater in philosophy that people just can't see because they're not trained to read it. Uh, so... Watch out for those leading questions, those loaded questions, and definitely judge them for what they are when they are, you know, totally out of hand. But then see it in the theater, the theater of the, the book. Uh, 
there or any dialogue really it doesn't it could be it doesn't have to be the the republic but any of the platonic dialogues there's also some obviously questionable political ideas and again we don't know the extent to which that we should read it as plato's actual ideas or he's allowing it through theater to come out there's arguments about this if you read the commentaries i don't really particularly have a, a final opinion but we certainly always are going to be discussing Plato, I think, for many, many decades at least to come, if not hundreds and thousands of years to come. So we're open to different viewpoints and, and need to be. So there's some questionable political ideas as well, uh, which we won't get into now, but you know, if you read uh, Plato, you'll see them. Uh, and then there's this idea, especially in the Republic, of a theocracy, uh, which again, you can interpret different ways, but it's definitely a con, especially in our modern world. But uh, uh, theocracy without art in particular, so kicking out the poets and so forth, is obviously a bad policy because poetry gives us cool things to memorize and teaches us a lot. That's really important. All right, so Bruntiver gives us a hell yeah as well. Nicholas says, man, I feel like I fell into Wonderland. So much great content that I absolutely agree with. Cup orders in for the holiday gifts. Awesome. Thanks for that. And uh, glad you're in Wonderland. And, uh, well, you know, we don't always want to be agreed with either. So if you disagree with things, please uh, please uh, share that with us as well, because that's what dialogue helps us do, is also to not always agree. Uh, so theocracy without art is a problem, for sure. So um, Nicholas says, being so chatty because of the lack of people on here, well... Thank you for being chatty. Uh, make use of this. We're here live, and uh, this is a cool opportunity to use the technology in the present moment and enjoy it right now. So uh, you are having a magnetic effect, to be sure. Uh, so please continue. Brunhaber says, Noam Chomsky says that convincing people is an aggressive form of communication. Uh, strangely, it is easy to understand why. Um, yeah, I mean, Chomsky is an interesting cat himself. He... He himself uses rhetoric to convince people and uh, certainly does so aggressively. So it is, uh, it is that, it is, he's not free of it. He's not free of it. And many commentators, of course, they just paint a huge target on their heads when they are commenting about other, uh, other authors and so forth. But in any case, um, Brunhaber says, Wonderland and the Republic are a delight to hear about. Uh, and Nicholas will challenge a thought for sure when he wants to. Excellent. Perfect. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world. We're going to read an extract from my new book about the allegory of the cave. And, uh, but before we do that, let's, uh, just look at the key text on Platonism and how it can help us, uh, think more critically. Circa 375 BC. Remember I said other dates were going to come. Now you could create a mnemonic that would help you remember that. And if you wanted to remember that Plato was approximately 50 years old when he read the, wrote The Republic, well, then you can also use like laser a game of laser tag, as I, as I would, uh, to help you remember that. And then you could also snap on the dates uh, that Socrates was executed, if you have a major method 00 to 99. And then that's going to give you this timeline in your head uh, all these dates, you'll sometimes see them represented differently in different places, but you can use memory techniques to just get some dates and then memorize the source where you found it and uh, be able to say, well, according to what I read in this or that source, like the introduction to the Republic, then, you know, that those were the dates that were presented there. And uh, that's just a cool way of having a timeline in your head that helps you connect different points of history, which leads to critical thinking that also allows you to use space because we're talking here about things that took place in Athens, for example. And if we then think of how much time passed between Plato and then, you know, I don't know, someone like Bruno, Giordano Bruno, then we can really craft that out and think about it. So that's uh, really, really important. And uh, as you may or may not know, this is sponsored by the Magnetic Memory Method. If you haven't got the free memory improvement kit, the links are down below. You're going to want to do that if you want to recall complicated formulas, philosophy, ideas, speak languages faster because you can memorize vocabulary and phrases on mass and master technical language in any field, absorb ideas from books and lectures and memorize dates like we just looked at, then you're going to want to do this. Um, 
by going to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. Now, before we get to reading from this extract of my new book, let's talk about some of the memory improvement exercises that we can use based on what we've learned from Plato. So one of the things you can do is when you're reading any book, create a dramatic figure. When you're listening to any lecture, create a dramatic figure, right? And then have that person create a dialogue. Have a dialogue. So imagine you're watching this boring lecture with your professor and the lecture is like super boring. It's dense, all kinds of information. Here you are as Edgar the Elephant. Oh, I really need to learn all this stuff. I need to remember it. And then this guy is like, I am the evil Dr. Forget speaking so slowly. You can't even pay attention to me because... Bleh. But you now actually have him as this animated figure in your life beside another figure in your life. And uh, you have them engaged in a dialogue with each other. And you're basically playing the role of Socrates to the speaker or the author of the book or whatever it is that you're engaged in. So have a dramatic figure that you can engage in dialogue. And it doesn't have to be someone that you invent. So we all know the what would Jesus do phrase, right? Well, imagine your favorite philosopher is someone like Jacques Derrida or uh, Deleuze or Plato or, or whoever, and you're listening to a discussion on Baudrillard or whatever, and now you've got Foucault in your mind saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, and you're starting to dramatize it in your head because you have a dramatic figure. Now, you want to do this in a way that's not going to obviously interrupt your flow of absorption and understanding, but if you practice it a little bit on content that, that doesn't really matter uh, that much, then you'll be able to develop it as a skill. So I did this when I was in university. And what I did <laughs> in order to help myself understand certain texts, I used to have Frank Zappa interview people. And one of the moments that I, I just remember very, very well was having Frank Zappa interview Karl Marx. And it was a bizarre sort of thing, but it really helped me understand what the heck was going on in that strange philosophy of Marx's. And, uh, you know, it's quite nuanced, actually. There, there, there's some good stuff in it, and that's the problem with it, is that there's some, some truth in it and some good stuff uh, that especially young minds adopt very, very easily with uh, malicious intent. But uh, <laughs> that's what I did. Is I, and why was it, why did I choose Frank Zappa? Well, it's because Frank Zappa, in, uh, I think it was called the Real Frank Zappa book, uh, he said something very compelling against Marxism. He said, people just want to own stuff, right? And so when I was reading uh, Marx and struggling through it, and it was just kind of, man, you know, like Das Kapital is a snore fest, to be sure. But to switch on, to make it more exciting, to make it more interesting, Frank Zappa was there every step of the way and just saying the kinds of things I imagined Frank Zappa would say in Zappa's voice. And uh, I had them literally on a stage in my mind. They were on a stage in my mind, and it was almost like Oprah, an Oprah set, or a Phil Donahue set, better said. But somehow it was kind of like Oprah meets Phil Donahue set. And I would just have Zappa in my mind grilling Marx on this, that, and the other thing. And uh, it really, really worked. And it just, it just helped at that time to, to struggle through some dense reading material that wasn't all that exciting, wasn't all that interesting uh, in, the global, in the big scope, scope of things. The ideas are really interesting and so forth. The actual text, which you need to read in order to have any uh, understanding of it, you, know, you have to submit yourself to it if you want that kind of knowledge. You have to practice reading that kind of knowledge in order to fully absorb it. Uh, but to get through it, it's a great, great technique. And it helps your memory because you can remember some of the things that, you know, your character asks. And uh, that helps you fight off the evil forces of the evil Dr. Forget. Because he's always here. He's always trying to get your, make you freeze. Freeze up and not learn. So you can warm him up with some sort of dramatic figure. The other thing, too, that's really, really interesting is to have your figure describe what is being said by that other person. So let's say you watch a lecture on YouTube or whatever, and you have your fantasy figure, like how would, how would Frank Zappa d 
describe Jordan Peterson's key point about episodic memory or nestic memory in uh, Maps of Meaning. How would, how would that play out, right? And so you read Maps of Meaning, it's kind of like a hard idea. How would Zappa do it, right? Or how would Plato do it? Or how would Foucault do it? Or whatever. Um, this is a great brain exercise. It stretches you to think through the lens of another person, but it ultimately also makes it interesting. And then you can prescribe, right? So let's say that um, uh, now Zappa was not just going to describe what uh, is being said in a book, uh, whatever that book may be, but he's actually going to prescribe it. He's going to turn it into law and say, this is what you do first, this is what you do second, this is what you do third, right? So, you know, just it, it doesn't have to be correct of exactly how that figure would do it, but you're just helping your mind get into it. You're warming things up so that it's it's not so frosty in there and uh, that really really helps and as you do this you want to kind of keep in mind something very good i think which is to craft a journey towards specialization for you being a greater individual so you're you're resting on the shoulders of giants in your mind that you respect and admire intellectual heavyweights or whatever and you're helping yourself tap into your own specialization of that figure what would Zappa say, for example, and then you're putting that onto another topic and you're becoming a greater individual yourself. So uh, one of the ways that you grow as a person is through being able to mentally imagine other perspectives that other people have and then map them onto yet other perspectives, right? This is a huge part of critical thinking. It's a huge part of becoming relatable and developing greater levels of empathy. And then, of course, you're going to remember more because you've done things through the uh, lens of, of critical thinking, of, through dialogue, through dramatic figures and so forth. And if you can also have it play out in something like a talk show host arena or whatever works for you, it's great. And if you want to create little puppets to help you, why not? Look, playing with toys does not have to stop when you're a child. You could play with toys all, all day long. And in some sense, what we're doing with memory techniques is playing mental Lego, right? That's what we're doing. We're playing mental Lego. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, you know, just get some toys. It doesn't have to, You can have your G.I. Joes or whatever. Or uh, well, we've got here um, Heimdall on this thing here. I, I, I don't know. Um, I always have Yoda nearby. Yoda is a great mental figure. In case you don't know what this is, this is an old school contraption. Looks like it becomes it comes from a, uh, a torture museum. But when you're writing books, you know, you it's a stand. You stand uh, your handwritten notes in here and you uh, put them there and then you, you type your notes uh, from your from your notebook because I I practice digital fasting. I write away from the machines. I spend a lot of time away from computers and then I uh, type it up later. And I always have Yoda on here because Yoda is a great mental figure that uh, is, he's a dramatic figure who's in my mind, you know? It's like not just do or do not, there is no try, but it's also just this kind of quiet mind power, you know? And uh, asking the right questions. And that's a lot of what we're doing today is learning through dialogue how to ask the right questions, but also how to ask the wrong questions, right? So there you go. All right, let's check in with the chat. Uh, Reclaiming Life wants to see the interview with Zappa and Karl Marx. Well, we didn't film it, but it, <laughs> I did write it out. I think it's lost to the wind now. I, that that uh, hard drive is gone. Uh, but I actually drew a, a, a cover page for it and so forth and had, had an image of this <laughs> dialogue. It was quite something. Um, wonderful that you would love to see it, but, uh, you know, create it in your mind. Uh, Nicholas says, what are a few strategies to learn to type Taking notes, you're answering this just now as I type this with much smarter words. Okay, um, well, the actual note-taking episode of the podcast and blog post, I'll share with you in the chat here so you can check it out. Um, let's see if it comes up when I actually type. And then I could share that link with you on note-taking. In terms of learning to type, you know, I've never thought about memory techniques to help you learn to type, but, uh, well, actually I have. Uh, there's an older episode on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast about Dvorak, so I can share that link with you as well. 
it's with uh, Timothy Moser. Um, but it's going to take a while to search that one up because I didn't know as much about how to do, <laughs> structure data for websites. But in any case, uh, there, there's some stuff there. He has some ideas. But I don't, at the end of the day, think that it's a, a memory mnemonic thing that you need to do uh, for that. Um, in any case, uh, let me see here. Where are we in the chat? So Physico says, are you saying that the people that dialogue in your head must disagree in their views about the subject? Not necessarily disagree, but they can certainly um, challenge it uh, or ask for clarification from a particular viewpoint uh, or even just ask for clarification. The point is, is for you to start having a dialogue in your head and also have a dialogue in real life. But the more you have a sort of dialogue in your head, the more you're going to remember these techniques, or sorry, remember these ideas that you're reading in books and, uh, and have, have more of a discussion. So just to take another, another thing, uh, I'm reading Willpower Doesn't Work by Benjamin Hardy. I recently just had um, uh, James Clear on the podcast who has a book called Atomic Habits. So while I'm reading this, I can actually think about what it is that James Clear is saying there about like dopamine spikes and, and, and so forth and habit stacking as he talks about it in Atomic Habits. And I can actually have my mental representation of James Clear in mental dialogue with Benjamin Hardy. It's, it's, it's actually just me doing it, right? But it's a neat way of remembering better what it was that I learned from James Clear and actually attributing it to its source because that's where that I learned it, which is then actually neurochemically, it's going to create more myelin sheaths in the brain that strengthen the memory of what exactly I recall James Clear saying in Atomic Habits about dopamine spikes and the, uh, the role of maximizing dopamine spikes through habit stacks. And then it's going to get all wrapped up neurochemically with this. And it's going to be distinct because I'll remember James Clear speaking about it with Benjamin Hardy. It's a beautiful, beautiful way to operate, to, to, to work, to read. Uh, it does raise the level of challenge at, for some people, but until you're practiced, uh, or when you're, when you're practiced, then you just do it normally, and it's no problem. Um, and it extends, too, especially when it's in philosophy. So these guys are, like, talking about essentially self-help topics. But when you... Um, when you are like reading, say, Michael Shermer or whatever, and uh, then you're reading, I don't know, you go and read one of his, uh, his uh, uh, arch nemesis, uh, nemeses, like, uh, um, I don't know, he's got a couple, but <laughs> when, you're, when, you're, uh, when you're reading these other dudes that he's constantly battling on the stage, um, Deepak Chopra or something like this, let's just go with Deepak, well, then you can actually have Michael Shermer as you're reading Deepak being like, what's the, what's the baloney kit from Shermer that we can switch on here? It's very, very powerful. All right. So, um, Nicholas says, definitely learning lots here. Love the finger puppet. What's that all about? Well, this is Edgar the Elephant. And Edgar the Elephant is trying to become an elephantologist in a story I'm developing. And uh, that's uh, because his mother was the last elephantologist and she died. And uh, basically what ended up happening is that uh, uh, the evil Elon Tusk took her tusks that contained all the knowledge of elephantology and used it to implant a cold, cold heart inside of the evil Dr. Forget who goes around causing students around the world and learners around the world of languages and other things to forget. And so Edgar has to get the tusk of elephantology out of the cold heart of the evil Dr. Forget and destroy the corporation created by Elon Tusk. <laughs> kind of silly, but uh, <laughs> fun. Um, I'm sure I've read the beginning of it to you before, but why don't we just jam it out again right now? I need to memorize it at some point, but I want to memorize it when it's finalized, not, uh, 
not complete, not uh, an incomplete form, because correcting what you've memorized is a skill, uh, but it's annoying to do if you don't have to. So I'll finish it, but it's something like this. Edgar the Elephant wanted to learn not just for pleasure, he needed to earn, to pay for school, to pay for the rent, to pay for the candy he eats during Lent. Plus, Edgar the Elephant had so many goals, just to get one of them, he'd sell you his soul. He'd already paid in buckets of sweat, but all that rote learning hasn't paid off just yet. And worse is his enemy, Dr. Forget. Dr. Forget melts knowledge like snow, and that's very bad when you just need to know. When you just need to learn, it's easy to go wrong, and the tune of your failure is this doctor's favorite song. It turns all the gears in his dark little heart, and that's why forgetting is his well-practiced art. Anyway, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get deeper into that uh, in the future. I've written a lot more. Uh, I don't think I'm a natural poet, but uh, in any case, lots of fun. All right, so... Uh, da, da, da. Nicholas says you're a growing giant yourself. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Nicholas says love the toys, the figures, digital fasting, gold nuggets, one after the next. Folks, come on, come on. Yeah, come on. Hit the thumbs up. Let us know where you are in the world if you're just joining us. Uh, Nicholas says he's got potential. Peggy says love the figure puppet philosophers. In first grade, a shy student had difficulty retelling a story like Goldilocks or the Three Pigs but give them puppets and their tongues were liberated. Yeah, well, that's another thing, right? You can just liberate yourself by just surrendering to play. Whether you actually do this or not, it's up to you. Uh, I like to do this kind of thing, but um, you can just do it mentally as well. I did it mentally for many years. I don't really like to collect objects and so forth, uh, but I also am willing to let go of any object that I do collect because you have to anyway, you're going to die one day. And uh, it's not about objects, it's about um, the good stuff that you put in your memory. And uh, that's what I really focus on. But there's no doubting that objects are things that we remember, so, uh, and help make things memorable. So, you know, dive in and check it out and see what releases your creativity. All right, uh, Reclaiming Life is, sharing that it was from May 8th, 2014. Excellent, excellent. Those dates sometimes change when we update things, and I probably should update that one. It's a pretty good episode. Um, Physical said, did I hear it well? Elon Tusk. I think this name is an homage to someone. I think he'll be happy to know about this. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. If you haven't seen uh, my episode on the seven reasons why having a memory implant will suck, then you definitely want to check that out because that was not so much an homage to Neuralink which I think is, you know, it's a good idea in, in one sense, but in another sense, it's really ridiculous. And so you can go through the seven reasons why I think that that's crap uh, and, and always will be uh, and, and should maybe not be, well, to each a zone. Let's put it that way. Uh, Nicholas says, love the story, man. Write kids' books. Thank you, uh, Master Anthony. It's too cool. It's not about what you think. It's who you can liberate some way. Liberation is what it's all about. It's all about liberation. And how do you get liberated? Well, you've got to understand the difference between practicing memory techniques and the knowledge that memory techniques can help you have in your mind, right? Because you are liberated by knowledge and you should do whatever it takes to get knowledge because knowledge is what sets you free. But memory techniques are the indirect access to knowledge, more knowledge than you could have if you don't use them. So everybody who hasn't, hit the thumbs up for that and uh, give me a hell yeah in the chat. All right, so all of this is kind of, it's kind of paradoxical, but you want to use these techniques to craft a journey towards being a specialist. And that will give you a greater sense of individuality, but paradoxically, it will make you more assembled with the external world because you'll be part of the dialogue and you will see that the you you think you are is less of less and more, right? You're, you become integrated. You become integrated. And uh, this happens because you engage in more dialogue in real time, in real spaces, in real places with people, and you pr practice more reflexive self-monitoring. So, you know, Socrates, you know, was, was to say that, you know, you want to have a self-examined life. The, the life that is lived unexamined is not worth living, right? And that's very true because so many people 
They just go through life completely deranged and whipped around by their thoughts. And their thoughts are completely out of control and they have no mental peace. They have no clarity. And that's because they're not, they're not doing any acts of monitoring. And so the more you play with your mental content, the more you develop mental discipline, then the more, and the more you develop critical thinking skills as a result of this, the more you're going to have this beautiful, beautiful integration with the world. You're going to resolve yourself into the flow of the world. And it, the more you do right as a good in and of itself, then the more you're going to get, you know, this kind of karma yoga. And karma yoga is just doing good because good is the thing that you should do, but plus letting go of the outcome, letting go of the outcome. And the more you specialize in these matters, the more you're going to understand letting go of the outcome really, really does matter. And the more bliss you're going to feel because your brain actually has receptors in it that fire off dopamine at higher, higher levels and with greater consistency when you can enjoy the present moment and just let go of outcomes because you're doing good as a good in and of itself. This is in Plato. It's uh, very, very clear and it comes from reflexive self-monitoring and being in line with the truth. But the truth as something that is always becoming that which it will become because you've let go of that outcome and you are in the dialogue. You are in the dialogue, not trying to control it, not trying to push for this or that outcome, but rather being a true scientist, a, like a true doctor of philosophy, which anybody can be. You don't need the laurels. You don't need the degrees. You can become a doctor of philosophy for sure just by following these principles. Um, so what we want to do is we essentially want to hunt after knowledge. And we want to hunt after knowledge with metaphors, with analogies and allegories, and then we just want to rinse and repeat. So I've talked about you know creating these dialogue figures well, these are, these are kind of like metaphors for how, how a thought can be thunk and you put it in there and then you make analogies, right? This is like that. And you need to do it from within your memory, not, uh, well, uh, on this, this page of this book, you know, uh, you've got to be able to do it from within memory so you can juggle it in your mind. And then you want allegories. So the allegory of the cave, we'll uh, read that section from my book. Uh, since there were enough hell yes to do so. Um, and uh, essentially, we want dialogue as a critical thinking practice for life. We want to understand that we, we need to think out loud. We need to hear others think out loud. We need to be in that space. We need to be in that space. We need to actually be part of it. Not the passive consumer of it, but the productive creator of it with other people. And we can do it online, but we also got to do it in the real world. The real world. My wife, I'm with my friend Nick often, and she's like, you know, <laughs> watching us argue, or she thinks, well, you know, she uses the word argue. We're not arguing. We're actually, like, engaging with the world's problems, bringing this and that figure, this and that idea, and mishmashing them together to sh put light out into the world, put light out into the world. And it's in real space, in real time. Or when I go to the, the, the meetup group where we talk about, you know, Jordan Peterson's ideas here in Brisbane. It's real. It, it matters that it's real there in the park. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have these internal dialogues with, an, with ourselves, and then we're going to have dialogues with other people to get the best of both worlds. Now, you don't have to be like, well, I was talking to Frank Zappa and Karl Marx in my head the other day. No, no, no. You just integrate that stuff, and then you just – it comes off the top of your tongue a lot better because you're there with people uh, because you've internalized it and you've rehearsed it in your mind. So uh, use memory techniques to help, right? Uh, so <laughs> Nick, uh, Christian says, I hate that Elon Tusk. Yes, <laughs> he's a bad one. He's a mean one. Mr. You're a mean one, Mr. Tusk. Uh, well, we probably don't want to go that way, but <laughs> in any case. Um, and you confirm that techniques are not the end result. That's right. They're, they are an indirect means to knowledge, but they get us directly they integrate the knowledge directly with us, and we can't do it without them. Uh, we're going to use memory techniques one way or the other, so we might as well use the best of the best. Nicholas says, hell yeah, consistent action taker. Must apply what you want to learn completely. Absolutely be all in. Be all in. Reclaiming Life says, the techniques are simply steps on your personal journey. They are, and I, I hope to communicate that, and we'll get into this in this reading. But your personal journey is not personal. It can't be. 
Um, and that's, that's one of the huge lessons that we can learn from the Plato's cave, uh, the allegory of the cave. Nicholas says, I never watch this kind of stuff. I will be from now on regularly. Mind feels exercised and the soul feels something too. Great. Uh, I really appreciate that. If you're new here and you're not subscribed, hit subscribe. Hit the thumbs up. Let me know in the discussion where you are and what you're doing. Uh, Maricella says, in the dialogue, I do not agree with everyone or everything people said. And people do not agree with me also. So I let it, well, so will I let it go? Yeah, let it go. I mean, do you need people to agree? Do you, do you need to agree with them? Do you need them to agree with you? If so, why? And to, who is it and what is it inside of you that needs that agreement, right? Really ask that question. To whom is this so important, really? And look around your mind. And probably what you'll find is that you can't really find that person because they're already gone. They're already gone. Um, so let's try and get my mouse working and get this uh, file open since we got enough hell yes for that. Great. The other computer is working. And uh, did you enjoy this, everybody? Let me know in the chat if you liked this kind of thing and if you'd like some more critical thinking and memory skills through the lenses of other philosophers on live streams like these. Let me know as I get this up. Um, Elsa from Disney and let it go. Yes, Marichella, let it go. That's right. Disney, Disney, Disney. All right, so let me see here. I'm going to have to get over to this other computer and actually search for Plato here. Um, let's see. I'm probably disappearing off the screen. Woo, goodbye. Uh, let's see. Cave. All right. So. I'll... Uh, Get this rolling here. And I write here, this is this the first draft of the new book, the first reading of the first draft. And uh, it's totally out of context, but I'm talking about the, uh, the allegory of the cave and interpreting it uh, with respect to understanding integration with the rest of the world as a memory technique, as a way of learning more, remembering more. So... I say here, there's a reason the allegory of the cave from Plato's The Republic has not only stood the test of time, but forms the basis of the popular movie The Matrix. The story shows us that after we free ourselves from imprisonment, the major sign that indicates the success of our release is that we return to the site of our punishment to free others. Allow me to explain, and then we'll get on with things in part two of this training. <laughs> In the allegory of the cave, a man who has been watching what he believes is the world play out before him discovers that he is tied to a wall. As he notices his ties during this moment of waking up, he looks around and notices a long line of fellow slaves tied to the same wall. Each of these poor souls is similarly tied to the wall. They are completely obliv oblivious to their enslavement and stare at a display of images in front of them. It turns out that they are watching shadow puppetry on the wall, an ancient form of cinema in a row of seats you can never leave. Aware of his situation, the man manages to escape his binds and turn around. At first, his eyes smart from the bright light shooting out from over the wall, holding everyone captive. But as his tolerance and courage grows, he is able to peer over the wall. He sees a fire, but not the kind of fire he had seen in the shadow puppet movie of the world. This time, it is a real fire. And moving in front of this fire are soldiers holding up puppets of boats and people and animals and other things. It is the light of this fire, the real fire, that casts the shadows that created the world this slave previously knew and held to be real. As if this shocking discovery wasn't enough, the man sees an even more profound light behind the soldiers, the man has no idea what this light could be, but he's drawn to it and finds a way around the wall. He has to fight the soldiers to get past them and soon finds himself running up a corridor. The pain in his eyes increases as he climbs higher and higher towards the light. 
With each step, his understanding grows. He has been trapped in a cave, and everything he is experiencing now is the real version of the fake representations previously mediated by others. He has been held at a remove from reality. At least, that's one interpretation of the story so far. In reality, the man has been completely immersed in the real world because cave walls, fire, puppets, and shadows all exist just as much as the brain needed to perceive them. It was the conditions of his experience that were hidden from him. And when the man finally emerged from the cave and beheld the light of the sun with his own eyes, he could reach only one two-pronged conclusion. This experience of the sun, the real sun, is far better than the confines of the cave. And because it is better, he is duty-bound to help his fellow humans by descending back into the cave and freeing them from their ties. And of course, these people resist. They kick, they scratch, they bite, they spit, they scream. And he can only free some of them. And yet he still persists. Why? Because the sun is so valuable, it provides all the fuel his discipline engine could ever need to go back down into the cave. Or, in keeping with the main metaphor of this book, the sun is, I'm not going to share that right now, but it is something that provides the calm and the certainty he needs to navigate the sometimes tempestuous seas of human stubbornness. Now, in The Matrix, Morpheus is the man who goes back into the cave after having somehow freed himself. And when dealing with Neo, one of the many people he has released in the full narrative scope of the movie, there is a point that so many people miss. Neo's training is never done. When Neo says, I know Kung Fu, Morpheus says, show me. And after they spar, Morpheus gives Neo another test, more training, followed by another test, and more training. And soon enough, the tests are coming at Neo from the enemy agents themselves and their strongest representative, Agent Smith. Now, the movie ends by showing how Neo's graduation is nothing other than an opportunity to go back into the Matrix, which is the cave, right? And he goes there for what? He goes there to rescue more people. And then what happens after that? Sequels, in which he goes back into the cave to rescue more people. And the films are filled with more training sequences and, and so on and so on. And so that's the beauty of life, is that we just have tests and tests and more tests. And so my point is discovering the value of repetition and repetition without rote ro learning, right? because you do need to go again and again and again through all sorts of things, right? And the varieties of difference in the same are what matters. That's where we grow over time in our training. So it's the quality and the intent of repetition in your ongoing training, ongoing training with memory and meditation techniques that matters. We're not here to evade repetition but rather we want to optimize repetition so that we can move into memory as a behavior and performance that is entirely free from the blunt force hammer of rote learning. And for this, you will learn... Da, 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 da. So that's uh, my section from the book for today. There's a little bit more uh, about the integration here that we actually we could... Uh, that you would probably find useful. Uh, in terms of assemblage, but uh, let me know what you thought about that. We'll check in with the chat here. Christian says, I can definitely benefit from more critical thinking. Awesome. Well, we'll uh, keep pumping that out. Uh, Nicholas says, Maricella, check out Evan Carmichael on dealing with difficult loved ones. May help. Yeah, yeah Evan's an interesting guy for sure. Peggy asks, did you imagine a photo of Foucault in those mind interviews or some sort of avatar? Uh, well, yeah, Foucault is an interesting cat because I never saw him myself in real life, but I've seen footage of him. Uh, actually, Chomsky came up today uh, in the chat. <clears throat> I've seen him in, in speaking with Chomsky in video, and I've seen photos. And I, I read a biography of his life at one point, quite a big, substantial one. So it's a multiple amounts of mental representation all going on at the same time. Um... So it, it, it's both 
that and an avatar. The thing is, is that I don't actually see much of anything in my mind. It's quite conceptual and auditory. And so you don't have to see anything in your mind. Uh, and in, in many cases, what you want to do is actually work towards not seeing pictures in your mind, but rather conceptualizing so fast that it's free from image. It's, it's almost cinematic. Um, all right. Good question. Thank you for that, Peggy. Nicholas says you're on the right track, according to Jim Rohan. Uh, do you mean Jim Rohn? Uh, surround yourself with others that are lifting you up. Yes, yes. Uh, definitely do that. Uh, I mean, I think you mean Jim Rohn. Uh, and the whole idea is that you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. I think that that's true, and definitely it has an effect. And, and it has an effect because of the law of entanglement, right? And that has a lot to do with this, this thing about the person in the cave going back into the cave again and again and again because the, the way to be free in life is to be entangled with helping others, serving others, and uh, to see how you are, your, your entire life, Everything in it is represented in your neurochemistry, and you are deeply, deeply entangled in it. So the more you spend time with people, the more entangled you are with them at a very, very deep neurochemical level because they keep being processed in your, in your brain because they're coming in through your eyes, their voices coming in through your ears. And the more you spend time away from people, the more that you um, disentangle from them in a very real neurochemical way. Those... Those, um, you know, parts of your, your brain, they actually start to die. These little nodules that grow on the, on, the, on the synapses and so forth, the dendrites and whatnot, they actually start to decay. Your representation of other people start to decay. And uh, one uh, very, very important piece of advice that I always got, because I've moved a lot in my life, was that uh, the person who leaves is the one who's responsible for maintaining the connections, right? Because if you've ever had this experience where you go back and your friends, you just, you don't connect with them anymore. Well, it's not because they've really did change that much, although they may have. You've also changed, but it's also because the neurochemistry has changed. These actual chemical uh, pieces in your mind have withered away and decayed. Same thing with knowledge. That's why you want to reread books, right? It's because these actual no nodules they actually decay inside of the chemistry of your mind. All right. Harvinder's here. Good to see you, Harvinder. Thanks for saying hello. Um, let's see. Nicholas says, you'll have to do an audible, man, to your books. You owe it to the world. Yeah, I've never thought of myself as being an audiobook narrator, but maybe, maybe. Um, we'll see. What do you guys think? Did you like this, uh, this section of the book? I think the whole book is... Uh, Hopefully, hopefully okay. Uh, I really don't know. It's just the draft. Um, I didn't read. I didn't read it, but this is all coming out of understanding assemblage theory, and the 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 section uh, a little bit previous to this talks about how when you go to the theater, you're assembling with the theater, right? And you're building the entire thing in your neurochemical. So. The screen is shooting light into your eyes from a projector that is connected to other machines that made the movie in the first place. And your body is connecting to the theater seat. And so your entire body is reproducing inside of your neurochemistry the entire world. So you're assembled with it. And then what it's going to do is create these messages and so forth that affect your behavior and move you this way and the other way. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, Enable, enable the. Uh, it's 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 essentially a proof of the absence of free will because we are pushed around and we do things, we make decisions, based on what we expose ourselves to. Which is why that rule of uh, entanglement from the you know you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with is both true and also a dangerous one in the in the same sense because you might create false ideas about who you are because of your proximity and your entanglement to those five people that you're an average of. And so, you know, you just ultimately don't want to be attached to any of it and be aware of the fact that your neurochemistry is creating attachments all the time 
outside of your wanting it to do so. So you've basically essentially got to follow the magnetic memory principle of using everything that you do one sip at a time. Study the techniques, implement the techniques, and most importantly, practice them with information that improves your life and with people that improve your life because you're cruising for a bruising if you don't. All right. So Christian says, well written. I love the Matrix tie-in. Very relatable. Thanks for sharing. Oh, well, thank you very much for the kind words. Rudra says, okay, you are Buddhist. No, I'm not Buddhist. Buddhism is a very, very problematic. Uh, f no, not Buddhist. Not even close. Uh, Buddhism is a very problematic uh, thing. And uh, there's lots of, we won't get into it right now, but hardly a Buddhist um, and not particularly an adv advocate of Buddhism. Uh, I think that... Uh, Let's leave it there, but uh, not not even remotely uh, Buddhist. <laughs> Buddhism has ties to something that I that I do find very very interesting, which is Advaita Vedanta. But um, I think that that it's messy. It's a messy discussion, um, and I'm just not ever going to be a Buddhist for sure. <laughs> All right, let's see here. But thank you, Rudra, for your comment. Ridiculous says, Roan, I was mentioning him because her peeps were all opposite of her and she was uncomfortable. Right, right. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. I really appreciate you helping Maricella out. That's awesome. And, you know, this is a great thing. This is, this is why these dialogues are so important because the more you're active in them and the more you're engaged with them, the more you get multiple perspectives that you can actually apply and learn from and, and take what you need and, uh, and everything like this. Nicholas says, go oh, the opposite way of the masses. Well, yes and no. I mean, what are the masses, right? And who are they? Are we not part of the masses? I'm certainly part of the masses. Um, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's that easy. And certainly, one of my key points of this book is that you you need to use the tools of memory improvement if you're going to use them to actually make sure you understand what how how lacking in, how lacking in value sweeping statements are because you are the masses you know it's the i i play a lot in the book with with um sam harris's claim that you are the storm right and that's very very important because not only are you the masses and what i hope to convey in in what i'm saying here about about you know needing to go back into the cave is that you are the cave it's not just that you you know the real hero goes back into the cave again and again and again. The the hero is the cave, and the hero is all the other slaves because those slaves are represented in his neurochemistry, right? And he's also the soldiers. He's also the sun. He's all of these things. And this is essentially what Plato never really quite says, but the Neoplatonists pick up later, particularly Plotinus. Because Plotinus talks about how there's like this core of reality. And it is so powerful that like surfaces start to cover it. And truth breaks through the surface like this and shines out with this perfect light that is perceived by some and not by others. Uh, and so on. And what's so odd about the, the uh, Plotinus's neoplatonic reading of plato is that he's almost like describing how the earth was born because how was the earth was born well there was some some stardust that um got so tightly compressed and it started to spin or some stuff like this i'm not an astrophysicist but you know it started to spin and more dust is collecting and it builds up all this heat and and then it suddenly these gases are accumulating and some some crust of stardust and stuff starts to build around it and then it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and then this gas explodes up and other dust and particles explode up and create the atmosphere which traps some of these gases inside which then rain back down essentially onto the surface and start to create you know over thousands of years soils and or ocean first and then sediments and all this jazz, and then before you know it, like some organisms are appearing and and uh, fish and whatever. And then we're here right now, right? 
also in space. <laughs> and it, everything is just the expression of the dying of the star, right? And this is, this is what all the woo-woo guys never quite get at that's so blatantly obvious if you're a scientist. And then you're able to understand that Stephen Hawking, in the book that he wrote after he's dead, which is Brief Answers to Big Questions, I think is the title of it, he's just saying exactly this. We are the, the stardust. We are, we are the product of a dying star. And the reason why we're all one, the reason why we're all integrated, is not just because we're all integrated, but because the entire unified field is one. It's returning to nothing because it came from nothing, and it's all deeply integrated. And so the secret is to see that the thing inside of you that is seeing anything is the same thing that's inside of everybody else. It's just that you are having a representation of it in your neurochemistry that comes from the same dying star that somehow created this earth, right? And when you get that, when you understand that everything that you see is you, everything changes because you have nothing else to do but to love it as you love yourself because it is you and it is nowhere else other than inside you. And it can be nowhere else other than inside you because you just happen to be the unit through which the dying of the star appeared, right? It's beautiful. And you will return to that which from which you came. You don't need religion. You don't need anything other than just a bit of philosophy to help reveal it to you and the best of contemporary science. So go read Hawking if you haven't already and uh, understand that these guys are on the same page. It's just some of them understand the page better than others and they actually care about what plato cared about which is rational thought helping us reach conclusions that can be tested again and again and again through dialogue through discussion through the production of evidence that supports claims that matter very very simple very simple and i don't know why it's so difficult but some people just keep going back into the cave despite being spit on and kicked and lashed and whipped and so forth. And uh, others give up, right? Because it's too hard. Well, Morpheus didn't give up on Neo and uh, they took three movies to conclude, but <laughs> they got there and uh, everyone was liberated in the end. And then they just start the game all over again. So there you go. All right. Nicholas says, like Wayne Dyer said, be attached to nothing and understand you are nothing <laughs> it's more than that understand you are nothing and and that's a beautiful thing everything's returning to nothing everything is nothing in this moment the more that you are just there in the moment Brundheimer says best influential factors of success in someone are environmental factors weaving our way into what we dream is a meta skill worth worthy of interest yeah yeah well environment is everything right and that's why the number one thing that you need to really focus on always is who are you and where are you? And the one thing that we have the most will over is the where we are in many cases and our perception of who we are, right? And so even though I'm quite confident free will doesn't exist, that doesn't mean that will doesn't exist. Will most certainly exists. Uh, both the illusion of will and also the actual ability to exert will if we're lucky enough to be bumped up against the right influences and not the wrong ones, right? So I was very, very fortunate to bump up against very, very powerful good forces that in the pinball machine of life just kept putting me in the points, racking up the points thing. Could have gone different, right? And I had the wherewithal through luck and chance and all this sort of stuff to make better decisions certainly made bad ones, but make a consistent amount of better decisions. Just, you know, I don't know why, but I, I, that's the way that it worked out. And force of will growing because you see it as a skill. You see it as something that you must practice and that you must always have as a dialogue with your existing environment. So Brunheiber is absolutely right there. Brunheiber says, we are a bunch of atoms trying to understand ourselves. Yes, yes. And I would say we are understanding ourselves whether we're trying or not. Like this is all, Nietzsche said everything interprets, right? All of this is interpretation at all times. All right, your coffee sucks is here. 
Wow, I haven't seen you forever. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, you were saying, when you write down your material, you need to memorize on a flashcard and put it in a memory palace. Do you then put the image attached to that subject on the flashcard itself or on the object? You could do either. Uh, basically, just try both. Um, so you could, look, if you're going to do the flashcard thing, the, 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 the creme de la creme, the top skill to do is to have the, the, the core information on one side of the card. Let's get a card here. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, how about this one? MagneticMaryMethod.com forward slash YT. If you don't have our free course yet, please go and get it. So let's say your target information is to memorize this, right? Well, you don't want to have the, the answer here because that's just cheating, right? You don't stretch your mind at all. You don't exercise your memory at all. So what you want to do is if you're going to have anything on here, you want to have, like, say you want to remember YT, right? Uh, oh, where did I have to go? MagneticMoneyMethod.com forward slash YT. Well, then you might see a yak biting the Terminator's butt, right? Now, you could write a yak biting the Terminator's butt right here. And then, let's say it's a foreign language word or whatever, um, then what you would do is you would look there and you would say, what the heck was that image supposed to be, right? Um, so parachinam for some Sanskrit that I memorized the other day. If I was doing this, it would be parachinam here and it would be a parapant can, can spilling cheese all over a Vietnam vet who is uh, Rambo in this case. And then that way, I would just be thinking, what did that word mean? What did that word mean? Even better would just be to have a card that says... Uh, you know, yak biting the Terminator or parapaint can spilling cheese over a Vietnam vet. That way you're just like, what the heck? And then you're like, oh, parachinam. Okay, so you actually train your brain to solve the puzzle, right? Instead of feeding it the answer and encouraging cheating. And now mentally what you can do, look, mentally, what, what is a memory palace? A memory palace is just not having cards. There's the corner, stick the image there. That's what it is, you know, like this is this is a, a way of maybe um, training wheels in your way. Is that that's a new verb training wheels in training wheels in your way to uh, actually having the real skill, which is just putting cards, mental cards uh, onto locations. So if that helps, you know, whatever you do, just make sure you're not putting yourself in an environment that encourages cheating because cheating will never get you anywhere. It will never build the myelin sheaths in your brain that you need in order to memorize the information itself and also actually develop the skill, right? And so that's very, very important. And if you constantly trap yourself in uh, those weakness loops of cheating, the evil doctor forget wins every time. <laughs> so you don't want that. All right. Uh, Nicholas says, yes, I completely agree with you on the blanket statement and they can easily be perceived differently than intended in text. Just got to hope it gets taken positively, you know. Yeah, well, it would be awesome if everything was taken positively, but we catch people in different mental states and sometimes things rub them the wrong way. So it goes. Um, so, you know, we can't be walking around on eggshells, which is one of the problems with the, uh, with the current uh, climate with people being so super hypersensitive about a lot of stuff. But it's understandable why they're hypersensitive about so many things. They're eating really, really bad food. They're not sleeping right. They're sleeping with their, their apps and their stuff. Like, it's just... No wonder they're hypersensitive. They're not taking care of the unit. So we're blessed to have the light of the universe itself inside of us doing stuff to, you know, integrate with the becoming of that which we will become. And uh, they're sitting there poisoning their wonderful unit instead of treating it beautifully and moving towards more and more greater becomings, uh, to put it that way. All right. Um, Nicholas says, it is beautiful indeed. Love your enthusiasm and passion. I love your enthusiasm and passion as well. Thank you for being here. Uh, really appreciate it. Dun, 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 dun. Brunheimer, uh, Reclaiming Life says, your coffee sucks in the memory palace. Why not both to make even more connections for yourself? Yeah, I mean, just try different things, basically. And don't make the mistake of, you know, getting too comfortable with this or that approach because ultimately what you want to do is manage the challenge frustration curve. So things will get so easy that they become boring 
And if you do too much, you'll get so frustrated that you give up. And when you do that, then that's no good. So you want it to be in the middle uh, and keep raising the, the challenge. So for example, Sanskrit, uh, the Rupu Gita that I was memorizing, it got a little bit boring. So I just added on a bit of the, the um, uh, what's it called? The uh, Upadesa Saran. And uh, like I first had to memorize the name of the of the thing, and then, which was a great a great mental re- release from the uh, working with the Ribhu Gita, right? Just even memorizing the title, but I memorized the first line, then I headed on back to the Ribhu Gita. So you know, it's just like managing this challenge frustration curve, managing your own boredom, and then projecting yourself forward. And before you know it, you're back on track. Boom, 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 boom. So, Cosmos, uh, Bruntiver says, Cosmos, Netflix, Neil deGrasse Tyson will gladly show you that the universe is under no obligation to make sense to us. That's right. That's right. That's right. And it's, it's kind of cool, right? Because when you grow up and you become self-reliant, self-sufficient, then you'll find that you don't need the universe to be obligated to you because you're, 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 you're more integrated and you're just constantly giving back uh, without expectation of return, and then things tend to work out, provided that the giving is premised upon the truth of what you really want to do. And that's kind of a paradox, right? And I talk about it in the new book. How do you balance doing what you want to do when you know you just have to do what actually the universe wants or what pe- other people want? Let's make it more simple, right? Because the other people are the universe. And uh, if you just try to give them what they, what you think that you want them to have, well, it's not going to work. But if you actually find in yourself what it is that they want and give it to them and serve them, then uh, not only will they actively respond, or at least a measurable percentage of them, but then you'll actually trigger the brain chemicals that make it just A-OK no matter what happens. You just let go of the result. So it, it's, it's really, really important. And so the universe is under no obligation to take care of you, but people who are really good teachers tend to be taken care of. Um, and uh, they just got to keep on being good teachers. And how do they do that? Well, they keep on being good to the people they teach. And so it, I think it just keeps on getting better and better and better. Um, speaking of which, hit that thumbs up if you haven't already and you think this is good teaching and you're having a good time. And uh, let me know in the chat if you're just joining us, where you're from, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and if you have any questions. All right. So Rudra asks, how do you recognize which memory technique or mnemonic is better for information in hand for memorizing. I always have trouble with it. Um, let me see. I don't know what you mean by in hand, information in hand. Do you mean memorizing in real time? Uh, if that's the case, then what you want to be able to do is just be able to create and use impromptu memory palaces or use existing memory palaces in an impromptu way. And if you have trouble with it, then uh, you might want to get yourself involved in the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass uh, because that will give you an opportunity to learn more and uh, make sure that you're, you're ticking all the boxes that are needed in order to create effective memory palaces and to make sure that the imagery that you're creating is as effective as possible. Physical says, you are saying so much things exist, don't exist. What, 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 what precisely does existing mean? That's a good question. Well, as far as we know, what's happening right now exists, right? Um, the past, you know, if you read Gödel, uh, there's a great book called A World Without Time by a guy named Pale Yorgrau, P-A-L-L-E-Y-O-U-R-G-R-A-U, Yorgrau, um, A World Without Time. And it talks about the incompleteness theorem and some of the theories about, like, does the past still exist? even though it's gone. Like literally does the world of yesterday still exist? Is the surface of this room or the surfaces of this room still there from yesterday? Or has it somehow been chewed up by the energy of the present moment becoming the next moment? And uh, does the world uh, exist in advance of us getting there? I don't know. What we do know is it exists right now or something exists right now. Something is happening right now. That's the only thing that we know. And so this is the, this is the trick, right? This is the trick of, of being a free person, being a person who's fully alive. It's just being with the now. That doesn't mean you don't plan for the future. It doesn't mean you don't have memories of the past. It's that you've optimized your ability to plan for the future and to use your episodic and nestic memory in particular in order to 
chart a better course into the future that is coming into being right now. So what does it mean for something to exist? No idea. But I think that that is what it means for something to exist, is just to simply be your best possible self at every given moment and be fully able to access what you know when you need to know it because you are prepared to execute in the moment, right? And to be really, really ethical in every moment and completely radically honest at every given moment and just simply surrender to whatever is coming and becoming that which you will become with that, you know, uh, reflexive self-monitoring and just being able to manage multiple levels of information at any given moment, to be something like the chess master of your life, because you know that everything is coming into existence with you as you yourself come into existence. And so you can actually use different kinds of thoughts to position things in particular ways, but you've got to be able to let it go, because you don't know if you're going to win the chess game, right? And you're not even going to enjoy it if you're sitting there worrying too much. You've got to enjoy the game. You've got to enjoy the game. And when you see some of these guys who like play multiple opponents at the same time, you just see the joy and the enjoyment in their faces. You know, it's, it's just like not really caring. They're just, they're just playing and enjoying. And uh, their level of mastery is as such that they're just fused with it. So I used to talk a lot about Zen archery and memory, like the perfect sweet spot of memory. And this gets to um, the question of, you know, Ruja was asking about memorizing in real time. The sort of sweet spot is to be able to be like a piece of information comes and you're just like a Zen archer. You grab your bow, you're perfectly fused with the bow, you're perfectly fused with the arrow, you're perfectly fused with movement, physics, time, space, velocity, duration, etc. And then that information comes and you just, whew, and the arrow goes through the information and sticks it on the wall of the memory palace with so much beautiful force that it's there when you need it so you can get it into long-term memory and because you're so intimate with the memory palace you're so intimate with the arrow you're so intimate with every single movement it just happens in one flowing motion Vroom! and you just practice that as a skill for life and there you go there you go that's it that's that's what exists what exists is your memory and your ability to draw on it this is essentially what jordan peterson talks about in Maps of meaning, right? It's basically, uh, let's see here, page 77, uh, or 75, better said. Um, or was it 77? Yes, it was 77. <laughs> the first memory was correct. So he says that the emergence of narrative, which contains much more information than it explicitly presents, further disembodies the knowledge extant latently in behavioral pattern. Narrative presents semantic representation of play or drama, offers essentially abstracted episodic representations of social interaction and indi individual endeavor, and allows behavioral patterns contained entirely uh, in linguistic representation to incarnate themselves in dramatic form on the private stage of individual imagination. Much of the information derived from a story is actually already contained in episodic memory. So in a sense, it could be said that the words of the story merely act as a retrieval cue for information already in the nestic system of the listener, although perhaps not yet transformed into a form capable of either explicit semantic communication or alteration of procedure. Uh, and then he goes on to explain why that that principle helped Shakespeare understand what Shakespeare, or sorry, what Freud understood about, um, about Shakespeare's Hamlet because he was drawing upon his competence, his existing competence, with a number of things, everything from Greek tragedy to Shakespeare himself. And uh, the, more that you, um, the more that you practice these skills of knowledge acquisition using the tools that we talked about on today's live stream, then the more you're going to be able to just absolutely um, to just grab information and memorize it, it, it with a variety of tools, one of which would just be your existing memory. And that's what's so powerful about that passage there is, um, is that your biggest resource and Christine Till on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast used the term memory reserve. So here he's talking about existing episodic memory and how it meets semantic memory in real time. I know it's a lot of mouthful and all that sort of stuff, but uh, easy peasy lemon squeezy, 
when you are actively engaged in the material. Uh, but basically, he, memory reserve means your existing levels of competence and how you're maintaining it over time. So it's really, really important uh, to just dive in and, and do, do these things uh, consistently. That's what really matters. Dan is here. Hello, Dan. Says, used a few memory palaces recently to pass the exam for an amateur radio license successfully. No doubt the techniques work. That's great, Dan. Congratulations. Everybody, please, who's safe to do so, not driving, please say congratulations to Dan. That's amazing. I'd love to hear more. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Maricella says, dialogue with my friend Maria, elementary classmate in the Aland, or is that Allende school from Mexico? Remembering our happy years, she said I had a, the Mexican flag marching while students greeted it. Wow, that's a great memory. Cool. Nicholas says, what is good food? What is good sleep? What are other routines to um, help take care optimally? Good question. Uh, we have a blog post and podcast episode called Foods That Improve Memory. And... I'd like to share that link with you because it's one of the most impactful episodes of the podcast that you can uh, go through. So we will give you that. And then when it comes to sleep, there's a couple of things on sleep that we've done. There's a video on YouTube where I was in Israel with a fellow memory man, Jonathan Levy, and we were, we were pushing it on some things and staying up a bit later than I would have liked. And we had a quite a memory adventure. So, um, Look that up some other time, but because uh, it's on on YouTube and can end up auto playing videos if we search there. But uh, check that out; um, <laughs> it's pretty funny the story of what happened there. Mm, so, Broomtiver losing battery. Well, thanks for being here. Broomtiver says, but physics says that we are limited in a linear perception of time, while time is happening. Time is instead happening all at once. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry your battery's running out, but uh, excellent uh, excellent that you got into our linear perception of time. And hopefully this will enter the episodic memory of others who will come back and, and check out some of these resources. Nicholas says, love your sweet spot balance, perfectly fused oneness explanation. Awesome. Awesome. Physical's asking Brunheiber, who I think had to leave because of his battery... What do you mean, Brunheiber? Time doesn't happen. We happen to move through time, according to physics. Well, Physico, the problem is, is that f according to physics is a very deeply problematic statement. According to who is talking about physics is a little less problematic. And we know that, you know, like, um, physics is very, very complicated. There's the popular physics, then there's like the real deal physics, and there's some uh, some really wacky stuff. So, you know, check out the recent um, Joe Rogan with Eric Weinstein and spinners and all this stuff. Like, you realize just how little the, those, the, the, the real deal physicists are actually sharing because the cognitive overload is, is pretty extreme with a lot of it. But he's very good at visualizing it for us. So, Nicholas says, hell yeah, it's a mouthful, but even though I'm an amateur here, I'm keeping up due to being actively engaged. Right on. Great. And uh, you are a great demonstrator of what it takes to be actively engaged. So, really, really appreciate that. Well, guys, and thank you, everybody, for what a, what a nice session today. If you're interested in more, I mean, I didn't get a whole lot of hell yes that people wanted more of these critical thinking sessions. So, let me know if you want to hear more, because we can go into Aristotle next time and critical thinking. But uh, if it's not something you're interested in, then we don't need to do it. Um, let me know. Uh, the Aristotle material is actually quite interesting because he is responding to Plato on memory. We didn't talk about Plato on memory today. If you'd like to, you can get uh, my commentary on Aristotle's on memory on Amazon. It's like 99 cents. Um, there's also a full video course on Aristotle and memory in the Magnetic Memory Method Mastermind group. If you're in there and you haven't taken it, you might really appreciate it. There's a couple sample videos of that on YouTube, but um, you can check that out. If I get enough hell yes, I'm uh, you know happy to do more critical thinking videos if you appreciate it. 
and I mean live streams and uh, more uh, non-live stream videos as well that sort of condense these ideas into shorter form. But um, if, uh, if there's just an absolute lack of willingness to even type yes please or hell yeah or whatever, then eh, maybe not. We'll see also. You have to replay as a chance too if you are watching this on the replay. Reclaiming says, thanks for another great live. I'm taking off for my time of personal reflection on the day. I love Aristotle, so I'm up for it. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, and I've uh, been writing the uh, meditation memory journaling stuff uh, in the book. I did most of it yesterday. Probably do a bit more today after I have a lunch and a break from this live. So uh, thank you for uh, raising that. I was always gonna, already going to do it, but had you in mind while doing it. Um, Physico says, relativity and the math-related Minkowski space to give some basis on math. Uh, okay, I uh, have to look into that. I, I'm not really an, a, a, an astrophysicist or a physicist at all. I just know that, you know, according to physics is a very dangerous sentence that does not show the mark of critical thinking in play. We need to say, according to who is, you know, to whom, the, the name of the physicist, and then we need to talk about what they're saying and map it onto as many other physicists as we can, and basically practice mental rotation because we need mental, we need multiple figures in mental rotation. So you need to know Einstein, of course, but your ability to understand Einstein is going to have a lot to do with your ability to understand Newton, right? And if you know Kepler, all the better, Copernicus, etc., then you know all the better, right? Because you have this beautiful timeline of history, and you have beautiful collections of ideas that emerge because Newton stood on the shoulders of giants, right? And then Einstein stood on his shoulders and so on. And then you get to Sean Carroll and uh, some other cats in the space. And, uh, you know, you understand. But it's very, very important from a critical thinking standpoint, like we were talking about today, we need absolutely 100% to see that it's according to whom, right? And then you'll notice that some of these people have different agendas, and then you can think about their agendas and you can think about them with empathy, right? Trying to see what it is they're trying to accomplish. Is what they're trying to accomplish true and good and with reference to the best possible outcomes? Or are they pushing things in dangerous directions because they're trying to fulfill uh, ego needs or short-term needs and whatnot? And you know what? It might just be that the world is so darn complex that both things are existing in the same figure, right? So my, my character of Elon Tusk, even though he's evil in my story, I certainly try my best to see those conflicting characters because many of us have two people going on at the same time in that sense. All right, so Peggy says yes to Aristotle. Maricella says thanks about sharing Plato and critical thinking. Uh, Ryan's Internet Adventure is here. Did you ever use... Heisig's book, Remembering Hansa for, Hansa for, uh, for Learning Characters. The book is named Remembering Hansa. You know, I'm really very familiar with Heisig's work. I think it's great for some people. They certainly uh, like it. But he's very polarizing also because a lot of people are like, what the heck is this dude talking about? And they can't get anywhere with it. I think I know why it's successful for some people. I think I know why it's full of holes for others. And I think it's, a, it's filled with some of the most obvious holes in the world. But I can't cast final judgment on what it will be for you. So it's worth every penny to dive in and find out and see. If you just get one good idea from it, it's worth it. You know, people go to the bookstore and they hum and haw and over, oh, should I buy this book or not? Yes, you should buy the book. <laughs> just buy the damn book. And the reason why is because if it's got just one idea that helps you, it's worth every penny. Read it within seven days and you can return it if not, right? There are very few books under the sun that don't contain at least one good idea. So definitely check it out. Uh, Peggy says, critical friends are important friends, not friends who criticize us. Yeah, that's true. Although we got to be able to like see sometimes the tough love in criticism that does come. Physical says, Heisig is a good resource, but you need to see words in context to really understand them. Think of him as only a first initiative. It gets very boring through time. Yeah, well, that's one of the problems is that just people who get hooked on mnemonic examples from other people, that it's, it's not only boring, but it's not going to help you because you need to know why mnemonic examples work. And he doesn't, to my memory, have anything even remotely close in that regard going on in his work. 
which is deeply disappointing because people who talk about mnemonics should know better. Um, or if I get off my high horse here, what a beautiful thing that someone put something into the field for others to learn from and increase the value of. Because the more you know about memory techniques, then the more some of those examples may help you because you can see the real deal mnemonics in it. So then it just becomes a thousand times more valuable. So always think, always be open to things uh, and, and see your ego in them, in it. The instant your ego comes, my ego comes, I'm actually pretty good at catching it in the moment. Sometimes I catch it 10 minutes later, sometimes an hour later. Oh my God, what the heck did I say? Uh, you know, but let it go, let it go. Um, Kartu Rajniya Parapayute Falam Karma Kimparam Karma Tajajadam. So we're talking about physics today a lot. Well, that is uh, from the Upadesa Saram, and it says, You don't control the laws that govern the universe, so why do you worry about the outcomes? Why do you worry about the outcomes? Just let it go. It's beautiful. All right, so Ryan's Internet Adventure says, I would agree with that. What do you think the difference between the quality of his mnemonics and the type you teach to create in the magnetic memory method? I'm pretty new to making mnemonics. Well, here's the thing. They have no value. They have no value. They're completely valueless, right? Because they're not teaching you how to create your own. And they're not teaching you about why creating your own matters. So you have to come and bring the value. You have to do the work. And so I think Heisig is better after you know mnemonics, so that you're getting some ideas that you then elaborate through elaborative encoding, it's called in memory science, based on your existing skill. Okay? And that's very different than, okay, so this is a, an image of a horse, see a horse. Uh, what if you don't see horses? What if you don't see images in your mind at all? What are you going to do? You have no idea about the magnetic modes. You don't know that there are six magnetic modes. You don't know that there's a seventh mode. Right. And then you're just totally lost and you're just like, how the heck is this supposed to work? Right. So if you go and look at the Amazon reviews and you see it very polarized on Heisig, well, 50 percent of them are, uh, you know, oh, yeah, this is great. And you can almost tell that those people have had a pre pre previous training in some mnemonics. And then the 50 percent are like, oh, this is totally madness. Don't get it at all. Probably have had zero training in, in mnemonics. So what is the obvious thing to do here? Heisig should do a new edition with some basic training in what mnemonics are, why they work, and he should have some memory. Well, should. I use should uh, very, very loosely here. Should have uh, some memory palace training, perhaps. But you can just get that from the magnetic memory method. Now, what is the magnetic memory method going to do for you? It's going to help you be free forever from seeking after mnemonic examples. You will not need Heisig. You will not... You, you may benefit from going through it, but you won't have any need from it. And you'll probably just be like, this is madness. I need to be creating this myself because I need it to come from myself in order to properly work so that I'm playing quote unquote mental Lego with my existing mental con content and basically getting the map towards the end goal of becoming what you will become based on what Peterson is saying here on uh, uh, page 77 of Maps of Meaning. And Unless you're willing to engage and deal with your existing competence based on your existing mental content and, first of all, ma mine into what a rich amount of magnetic modes you already have and memory palaces you already have, well then, you're just going to be waiting and waiting and waiting until that you do. Because that's the real deal. That's the real game. Now, there's other ways to get to that point. You can go listen to uh, John Graham on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast. I don't think he knew about my stuff before he went and became the 2018 memory champ. You can listen to all the people that I've talked about. Mar you know, Mark Shannon definitely, you know, had no exposure for me when he uh, became world memory champ. And yet there's a there's a there's an alternate perspective on not the same thing, but a path that gets you to a similar conclusion. Now, the difference between the competitors is, is that this is memory techniques that are leading you to skills that allow you to deal with volume for short periods of time based on information that has absolutely zero value to improving your life. It's just numbers, random words, faces, perhaps poetry, depending on the competition, some 
abstract objects, numbers you hear verbally instead of hear, seeing on a page, et cetera, et cetera, all to lead to a particular outcome and then forget it all, right? So that's a very, very different outcome that uses the skills differently and very few of these people, to my knowledge, actually use this to these skills to learn a language and they can't use it the same way to learn a language because it just won't work that way because you need to shift it and change it and actually create the imagery with greater integrity from the get-go because you want it to be available for recall rehearsal so you can get it into your memory reserve so that it then becomes a tool for adding more words in the game of mental Lego. So you have these existing pieces and then you keep adding new pieces and then those new pieces actually have the 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 parts upon which you're going to snap on the new ones. It's very, very different how it works because it's for long-term retention of knowledge, for language learning, for complex formulas in math or physics or whatever. It's for being able to deal with complex terminology, large learning topics, absorbing very, very quickly ideas from books. Very, very, very powerful to be able to do this. And you need, do you need to see it in the, well, you don't need to. You don't need to. I don't bog you down in the science, but it's all neurochemical. It's all based in the absolute best of the best neurochemical understanding because of the science of mental imagery. And so the six magnetic modes are helping you tap into a range of how your brain processes so that it doesn't matter if you see pictures in your mind or not. Mental imagery is extraordinarily varied and powerful, and each person has a hierarchy of preferences and they need to get familiar with it in different ways through actual practice. And, you know, some people hit the ground running faster than others, but at the end of the day, practice is practice and it's a beautiful thing. And as you practice, especially if you're practicing with information that improves your life, you will get these myelin sheaths rapidly growing in your brain. And you will also get dopamine spikes at the same time. So you create this little energy engine that just builds itself and creates so much enthusiasm that you can't stop because you love it so much and it feels so good. And it's just like, hell yeah, let's keep going. All right, so let's see here. Uh, Physical says, Heisek is a pioneer on remembering characters. If someone gets good uh, on it to make a good book based on him, we are talking about a possibly good book on, on memorizing. Yeah, well, there's a couple of people who certainly uh, tried to repeat what he did, tried to improve upon it, but they just end up making the core mistakes again but some people, again, find it very useful. Who am I to say whether it's useful or not? You read it, you try it. If it works, awesome. You'll have no complaint from me. I think it can work even better, even faster. Uh, but who knows? Like, not, not all people are ready for memory training at the same moment. And so, you know, pick your battles. Pick your battles and do what you're going to do. Uh, and just find the teachers who you trust and who you think actually are the real deal. And the real deal is pretty easy to spot uh, especially when it comes down to demonstrations of knowledge and expertise and care and compassion for an audience. Uh, so, you know, caveat emptor and carpe diem. <laughs> it's pretty simple. All right, so um, let's see here. Ryan's Internet Adventure says, do you remember mnemonics for words as well as characters or just a input immersion approach to vocabulary acquisition. No, this is a full, full deal. Uh, like it's, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's like that process of the Zen archer that we talked about before and being able to, to work with this and work with it consistently over time. So with characters, there's a process I came up with called the camp mist formula. It's in the magnetic memory method masterclass. What it enables you to do is in one swift blow, add an additional technique so you get the character, you get the the uh, the pinyin if you need it. You don't have to put the pinyin on there, but it helps. You get the tones, the exact tones, and you get the meaning and the sound of the word and the character all in one activity. I got it down to being able to do f one per five minutes. And so your you know existing level of skill is going to determine how you get there. So what you do is you go and you get the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass. You take the master plan, make sure you understand the magnetic modes, make sure that you are able to create proper memory palaces, create at least, you know, 
five to 10 working towards getting all 26. There's a logic to this. There's a reason for it. You're going to unlock your spatial memory. You're going to have this palette upon which to paint. And then you're going to go and you're going to find the, uh, the can't mist formula in the training. And you're going to see, you know, am I ready for this yet? Or do I still need to do the fundamentals? And, you know, you can make use of, of uh, asking questions if you need to, and then uh, get guidance. But your questions are only going to get answers that are as good as your practice where you're at right now. So um, if you need to start with the free course, just start with the free course. It's at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. Um, and it's in the link uh, below. If you're watching the replay, that's where it is. That's where it is now. And uh, we'll type that in there for you. And uh, if the free course, you know, helps you out, then you're going to want to get more information and more training and have the opportunity to really go deep into what these techniques can do for you because this is the path to knowledge. And as we said before, the techniques themselves are an indirect means of getting to knowledge. And it's the knowledge of the techniques themselves that will lead to the beautiful knowledge of the topic that you're trying to master. So, Physical says, Dr. Metivier has a blog where he sends you free lessons about it. That link I just did. Thank you, Physical, for mentioning it. Um, six to seven hour lectures that are each an hour long. Um, yeah, well, I mean, each course in the master class has a different length. Oh, uh, you should be able to go through the master plan with, th well, it depends if you two times speed the videos, which I don't recommend or not, but you know, between most people, they do it uh, in a weekend and then within two to five hours, they have the memory palaces set up. Then how much time to take to practice? Yeah, it's up to you. Um, it's up to you and it's, and it's up to the nature of the information, your existing level of skill, your dedication to the craft, and basically do you sip at it. Study the techniques, implement the techniques, practice them with information that improves your life. And you've just got to keep on doing it. And as Physico says here, do it at your own pace. But really the best strategy is to, you know, today's Tuesday in Brisbane, put on your calendar when you're going to go through the master plan, go through the master plan over a day or two, get yourself set up with the memory palaces, go to the study guide, look at the study guide, uh, you know, you'll have done the exercises and so forth, sit there with the study guide and go, okay, I'm going to take this course next, then I'm going to take this course next, I'm going to take this course next, and then go through the material and then just start doing it. You see in the chat here, people are like, you know, sharing their results of what's happened for them and, uh, you know, you won't regret it. I'm, I'm confident that you won't regret it. It's a, it's a skill that absolutely applies everywhere in life and if you really just focus on a goal with Chinese that you've clearly enunciated you set proper goals that you actually can achieve based on your existing level of competence and then you work towards increasing your competence over time you're going to make it you're going to make it and you're going to make it a lot faster and with a lot more fun than without it so it's pretty simple um, and it'll help you it'll help you it'll help you understand what your memory really is and get more comfortable with it as you master your memory. So, uh, Bruntiver is here. He's back, back on his computer. So, chatting about uh, tachyons here. Great, great. Uh, tachyons exist over the speed of light. They would experience time as an instant. Uh, Zhao is here. Thanks for saying hello, Zhao. Can I create a whole world with lots of mind palaces? Yeah, you can create. This is what we want you to do in order to get the most out of the memory palace technique. Definitely. Ryan says, I've got Jonathan Levy's course. Is there anything radically different in the master plan? Oh, yes. Very, very different. Uh, working through Jonathan Levy's course. By the way, if you're here and you don't have Super Learner, I'll share with you a link where you can get a special free trial. And that is appearing in the chat now. Um, so, yeah, but Super Learner is a very different proposition, and Super Learner is a, a good one for anyone to give a try who cares about improving their memory. Dive in. Doesn't matter to me which one you take first. 
so many, so many of our students are in both and they benefit from both in many, many, many ways. So Physico is back saying that the models just say velocities in theory don't go to the speed of light. The model says nothing about time in a per particle that moves faster than light uh, or light itself, okay? Brunheiber says to Ryan's internet adventure, I am also a student of Superliner. It is quite useful, but different. Yeah, they're both useful. Um, you know, we can't take any of those numbers with us. So if you care about knowledge and information and the ability to reach your goals, invest in yourself. You'll never regret it because it's just that easy. It's just that easy. Uh, and congratulations for investing in Super Learner. It's a good decision. It's a wise decision. Uh, physical says, according to relativity, no one says for sure still beyond that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, check out that recent uh, Joe Rogan episode with Eric Weinstein. Very interesting. I don't know that they say anything for sure either, but um, that was a very interesting interview. All right, everybody. So we didn't get a whole lot of hell yeahs about this critical thinking session. I'm not sure. What do you think? Should we do another critical thinking session in the future and more videos on critical thinking and memory? Or was this good enough and we just call it a day? What do you say? As you are thinking about that question, seeing if you want to encourage the content to come or not. Uh, <laughs> Brunhaber says, oh, now that I have both hands, hell yeah. Great, great, great. Uh, thank you for confirming that. Um, we definitely don't want to be putting things into the world that people don't want. Ryan's Internet of Interest says, hell yeah. Physico says, hell yeah. Excellent, excellent. Is there anything else that you want to see covered on a future live stream? Let me know. Let me know. Uh, so, Raymond in my email box says, how do you train for speed? Can you give any specific tips and tricks to train? Try to avoid tricks. Learn the fundamentals. Really get very, very focused and confident with a particular approach. Uh, dive deep into it. Add other approaches after you've gone through one thoroughly, done your due diligence, given it the good old college, more than the good old college try, but... Uh, like the actual results that you wanted from it because this everybody's brain is the same brain and they all operate on the same rules. So dive in, get it sorted, get some results, and then pick the information that you actually want to memorize and then train memorizing that information. So I uh, can, you know, practice with speed on cards. And if I want to get faster with cards, then the thing to practice with is cards. If I want to get faster at memorizing names in real time, which I put a lot of work into so that I go into rooms and memorize all the names with accuracy, then that's what I practice. I practice memorizing names, not from software, because that's a trap. And John Graham and I talk about that on the recent episode with John Graham, and he agrees. You want to practice in the real world. This is not just for me, but the 2018 USA Memory Champion. Everybody I know, every student I have, they understand this. You can put it on cards if you want, but uh, at the end of the day, you got to practice for names in real life with real names with moving targets if you want that skill. And then if you want to do it faster, well, then you just practice doing it faster in your mind. And uh, there you go. Um, so to summarize, learn the fundamentals. Really, really pay the dues of learning one approach thoroughly before you move on to the next. Because a lot of people, they get into magic bullet territory and shiny new object territory and, ooh, I'll get this before I finish that. And not just finished it, but actually get the results from it to make sure that you've milked it for all it's worth. Then pick the information that you actually want to memorize so you can get faster and then practice memorizing that. And then rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Uh, and it'll work a lot better if it's information that improves your life so that you can improve the lives of others. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right. Um, so that's a couple of hell yes. Hmm. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll decide. We'll see what comes through on the people watching the replay. Uh, or you can say hell yeah right now if you're still here and you haven't said so yet. 
So Physico in the future would like how to encode sounds from the IPA and images, uh, the music sounds and frequencies and images for perfect pitch. That's, uh, well, not the IPA, but music sounds and frequencies is already in the master class. So you can dive into the FAQ section for that. There's a whole video on it. Um, but whether or not it'll reach perfect pitch, I, I don't know. Be cautious of people who even worry about perfect pitch. You don't need it. You don't need it to be a great musician or to understand music. It's a, it's a, it's one of the, it's like photo learning or photographic memory. People will put those words on you and, and try to create magical pictures in your head that are just completely unnecessary. Uh, you don't need it. You don't need it to be a star musician at all. Um, but if you want to get lost in the fantasy, guess who likes the fantasy world? The evil doctor forget. He loves when people get caught up in the fantasies. Oh yes. Give me some more people with the fantasies so that I can melt their minds. Freeze them in place while melting their minds. I'm still working on my uh, Evil Doctor Forget video. Or you can be like Edgar the Elephant, who has the discipline to just master the fundamentals. Yes, I do. All right, so we'll, we'll think about the IPA for you. That's a good one. Uh, Ryan asks, how many hours of content in the Magnetic Mary Method Master Plan? Ryan, you're in for life. <laughs> It starts when you meet me on the internet and it ends when I die uh, because we just keep it going, keep it going. The goal is to have you be a lifelong practitioner of this technique as you continue to explore memory techniques. It doesn't end, but uh, in terms of what you absolutely need, each course is between five hours to one hour. Uh, there's nothing longer than that. And there are seven core courses. So, you know, think it through. And uh, then there's the FAQ section, which is not compulsory. You don't have to go through all of it. It is meant to be scanned and browsed. And there's the study guide, which will be a resource that you want to go back to again and again and again. And you've really got to think of this in terms of, do you want the Magnetic Mary Method and not worry too much about how many hours of content there is. There's a lot of trainings out there who are just like, and it'll only take you. Da, 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 da. No, memory training is for life. Memory training is for life. It's not some. It's not something that you set and forget, right? And uh, you you've got to you've got to turn it into a devotion to memory if you want the real deal skills. Uh, so, Ryan's internet adventure depends on what your initial goal is, but going through everything, if you get the most out of it, it will be a lifelong change, not countable in hours. Great. So that was a. <clears throat> that was a good way, a better way of saying what I was just saying. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for a wonderful session today. Let's uh, meet again in the near future. If you haven't let me know here in the chat that you liked this critical thinking session and or you're going to go back and watch some of the replay and let me know in the discussion below that you like this and want that, then, you know, maybe we'll do some more critical thinking stuff. Maybe we'll do the IPA in the near future. Um, that's normally the kind of thing that we would put in the master class, but we'll see. Uh, Zhao would like to know, to create a mind palace, I have to close my eyes like in meditation and try to walk in some place inside my mind. That is the way some people do it, but it is not ultimately the magnetic memory method way because we want to reduce or eliminate walking around in our minds. It's a waste of energy. You don't need it. The Magnetic Mary Method is, is quite different. Um, and it'll teach you how that if you need to do that, use it as a stepping stone to faster, better, because you've learned that that's not necessary. That's not necessary. You do not have to close your eyes. You do not have to walk around. And ideally, that kind of stuff is avoided at the highest possible level. Because to get to Raymond's question here, you... Um, if you want to practice for speed, you don't have time to walk around in memory palaces and you don't need to. It's not needed. And uh, so if you want to think about the core difference between magnetic memory method and uh, the, uh, just about everything else, we are reducing the memory palace to the smallest smidgen of mental energy and maximizing the outcome of doing that. It's very, very, very important. Physico says, the finger philosophers is the best idea from the last times. Xie xie, doctor. <laughs> well, xie xie ni, Physico. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, everybody, 
for what a great chat today was. If you haven't already, hit that thumbs up. Get subscribed if you're not here. Uh, you know, if you're not subscribed already, so you can join us the next time. Click the bell icon, all that jazz. And uh, let me know what your thoughts are in uh, the discussions. Come visit me at magneticmerrymethod.com. Get the free course if you don't have it already at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. I'm going to have lunch. I'm going to go keep writing on my book. And thank you again. Till we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care.